There's my name. Oh. Welcome to the um, June 25th Planning Board meeting. Um, I'd like to call, call to order. Um, let's uh, pledge allegiance to the flag. Mr. Dupuri? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Mr. McGee? Mr. Beely? Here. Ms. Auglis? Oh, I said twice. Here. Okay, um, in lieu of the fact that three of our permanent members, our regular members, are not here, um, our alternates, um, Mr. Dupuri, Dupuri and Ms. Auglis, will be voting members. Um, can I um, have approval for the minutes? We have two sets of minutes. Actually, we have three sets of minutes, I guess. April 5th, no. April 23rd? Mm -mm. No? Mm -mm. May 14th. Oh, May 14th and <coughs> June 4th. I'm sorry. Do I have a motion or? So moved. To approve both sets. Can we do it that way? Two at a time? Yeah. Okay, fine. I second. Okay. Any, uh, any discussion? Okay. Oh, a second. Susan, uh, Susan uh, seconded it. Uh, yes, she did. Okay. Okay. Uh, all those approved? Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, the first agenda item is Broadwood Land dis uh, Development Request a Subdivision Review of the Tuckerbrook Subdivision Payne Road Assessors Map R49 Lot 2. With their representative. Okay. Step to staff. Oh. Janelle usually likes to give a little bit of talk. Yeah. <laughs> staff comments, please. I'll just go. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, no worries. It's not on my agenda. <laughs> so, uh, this proposal is located in the R2 zoning district at 158 Payne Road. It's a 12 lot conservation <clears throat> subdivision. Um, the applicant has eliminated two lots from the plan since the board has last reviewed it. Uh, the application was last before the board in January for a preliminary subdivision review. At that meeting, the planning board uh, requested a wetland and vernal pool peer review. Um, that was completed in April, and the, the review found the applicant's delineation to be accurate and thorough. As the board may recall, the section of Payne Road is not currently served by public sewer. One of the critical review elements discussed in January was the consideration of having the applicant install a dry low pressure force main in the right of way of Tucker Brook Drive to provide the ability <laughs> for future connections to public sewer if and when the service is expanded to this portion of Payne Road. The applicant has indicated that they are not interested in installing this infrastructure, but staff encourages the board to have the discussion anyway. As the board understands, one of the primary purposes of a conservation subdivision design is to avoid impacts to natural resources. Staff would like to point out that the proposed location of the hammerhead turnaround results in additional wetland impacts that could be avoided if lots 7 through 12 were compressed and the hammerhead location was moved away from the wetlands on the site. Finally, it appears that lot 5 does not meet the minimum lot size requirement of 20,000 square feet in R2 zoning district. Uh, staff has provided a host of other staff and peer review comments, and I'll pitch it to Angela, our town engineer, to discuss stormwater management. Uh, I guess I wanted to point out that um, we're still working with Sebago Technics back and forth on the stormwater management piece. Um, they're showing an increase in peak flow right now in the 10 and 25 year um, storm event, and typically the board um, looks at those even insignificant, as they call it, um, increases as just that, increases. And um, the accumulation of those small increases we're seeing in other watersheds and um, around town. I know we've heard um, from other residents on, on different projects in different watersheds, but um, as development uh, occurs in, <coughs> in the growth areas, um, we're seeing that impact, and so typically the board looks to try to get back to that peak development 
flow rate um, because of that. And so I just wanted to, to point out that there is some um, ability to kind of work with the system that they have here and trying to, to um, throttle those back. This um, is in a greater watershed, is the Beaver Brook <laughs> watershed, which is on the threatened list. And it's threatened for potential for development, just for this, what we're talking about, where um, you um, have these growth areas that you can have these small little increases, little bites of the apple that eventually add up. And that's exactly <coughs> why this watershed is, is on that list. So just keep that in mind. That's it. Um. Okay, Sean. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is Joe Frustacci of our Rosewood Land Development LLC. Uh, as Jamel stated, we've been here a, a couple of times, a, a sketch plan proposal uh, with the planning board, uh, initial preliminary, and as Angela states, I've been going back and forth somewhat in terms of uh, the stormwater management. Um, just in terms of that, I think the main point is, is like Jamel did say, is that we actually have eliminated two of the lots. We were originally looking at 14 lots on this piece of land. Uh, we are now proposing 12. Uh, one of the issues had been really was the access, if you will, if you remember right, uh, to this back lot coming off from the Hammerhead. Uh, it seems somewhat problematic. It's a beautiful piece of land. Uh, I would have loved to retain that lot, but uh, we just thought it made more sense to, to eliminate that. Uh, as uh, well as, remember the stream, we had a 75-foot stream setback, which led to uh, a kind of a tight lot down on the, uh, uh, the lower side of the roadway. Uh, so we actually took that lot out as well. Um, obviously, as we go through this process, we're going to be putting in 12 lots with 12 brand new septic systems, subsurface sewage disposal systems that meet all the town requirements today and will be brand new systems. It's not that we just don't want to put a force main down through here. It's just, you know, what are the chances of this force main number one being utilized within any time frame? And uh, uh, number two, is that really going to be the system that's going to be what's going to ever be put out here on the main road if, in fact, something ever happens? Um, it's not just obviously putting a, 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 a force main in the road. At some point, these folks would actually have to buy the individual pump, a $7,500, $8,000 dollar pump. Obviously, if it goes into Payne Road immediately or very soon after we develop this, I think it's, it's not as if they're going to say, you know, okay, everyone with your septic systems, now you have to go buy that pump and tie into this system. I think it would be based upon, uh, you know, once those systems eventually fail, then at that point in time, rather than replacing it with another subsurface sewage disposal system, do you actually put in the pump we're talking about? Um, Again, it just seems so conjecture and so theoretical that it just, uh, again, we don't mind spending money as long as we get a benefit out of it. And it just seems that in this particular case, uh, you know, it just seems that it's a, a quite a theoretical type of discussion we're having in terms of putting a force main down this road uh, that may or may never uh, get utilized in the future. Um, in terms of the hammerhead, uh, the discussion we have has, and I, remember, this is, is pretty consistent with the sketch plan that we had with you folks in the beginning, that there are some pretty significant wetlands on the property uh, that we weren't going to try to develop down and through here with additional driveways, if you will, coming off from Payne Road, uh, that we were going to maintain uh, the work up along this ridge line uh, with the understanding that, you know, this depressional area and this eroded swale that was coming out of that were more than likely going to be impacted associated with that. Uh, the discussion has been is can we condense these lots and pull these tighter, if you will. Uh, the issue with that is, again, because we need subsurface sewage disposal systems, the area right in through here, uh, although it would pass anywhere else in the state of Maine, which requires nine inches of passing soils, the town of Scarborough requires 15, uh, and we don't have passing soils within this area. So the soils that we have to have for this lot are up in this area, within this lot are down in this area. So it's not just the space and bulk in terms of the frontage and, and the size of the lot uh, we're talking about so that would allow us to, to move this hammerhead back this way, if you will. It's actually obviously to get the, uh, the passing soils associated with that as well. Uh, the other part of this discussion was the peak rates, and I certainly understand what Angela is saying. Uh, again, from our standpoint, you know, a lot of this land is obviously heading down to this small brook, which just comes down and then ties into Tucker Brook and eventually Beaver Brook, so that these lots are on the downhill side. Uh, we're picking up all the road runoff. We're picking up all the runoff from the uphill lots. 
all of that's getting treated and detained uh, within the pond that we have in through here. Uh, typically what we try to do under those circumstances is to over detain, if you will, the flow that we get into the pond uh, so that we can let some of this go, specifically with the downhill lots. Um, and that's what we have done. We've definitely over detained what we can in terms of getting in there. What we are small showing is a small increase. Uh, it's a small increase associated with, you know, six residential lots um, within a, a relatively good sized watershed area down through here. We've, we've roughly, it's about 700 acres of a watershed that's coming down through here with some minimal, uh, what we, we consider minimal uh, increases in peak rates of runoff. So uh, it seemed to us, uh, based upon uh, uh, the staff review, uh, obviously the one lot, which is just under 20,000, uh, that was just something I missed. Obviously when we eliminated one of the lots and combined them into another one, I just didn't realize we came up with just slightly less than 20,000. We could certainly adjust that line to have the 20,000 uh, square feet. Uh, we have had a phase one archaeological survey done of the site. Uh, we have got the wetland alteration permit application into the DEP. Once that was completed, uh, we have worked with the uh, Portland Water District, and I know uh, we haven't provided that approval to staff, but we uh, have got approval for them in terms of the water line. Um, we are here asking for preliminary for the 12 lots, uh, but certainly we would like to have the conversation so that as we move forward from preliminary to final, if possible, uh, with this board, uh, that we could, you know, know for sure in terms of the peak rates of runoff, obviously, uh, in the uh, in the force main. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that I can associated with that, uh, and I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who wants to start? Sue, would you? Uh... Sue, Sue. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, Susan, that was when I when I when we removed one lot and combined two. Mm -hmm. I just I should have adjusted that line, so I have like nineteen thousand eight hundred there. I just have to move that line a little bit and may have that at twenty thousand. We'll have a twenty thousand square foot mm -hmm. lot. Okay. I don't have any issue with lot five. I can make that work. I have the biggest issue is the whole got, the whole thing about septic. I mean, I know that this is a small development, mm -hmm. and quote unquote. It's a small, it will, it will offer a small increase, but this is an area which is going to be developed further. It will happen. I mean, it may not happen today, but it's going to happen. And whatever we can do to try to um, hold off significant, here's the thing I'm looking at. Okay, part of the um, review comments that says, Public Works has highlighted that there are concerns regarding soils and age of existing septic systems in the immediate area and believes this is enough to warrant holding off significant roadway improvements along Payne Road <clears throat> until public sewer has been extended. I'm not too sure I understand exactly what that means. Hello, town engineer. Um, as it says, Public Works has made comments um, about the concerns with sewer and not with obviously the environmental impacts that are happening mm -hmm. and the, um, what, what we're getting for tests, for soil tests and um, some failing systems. Um, I'm, it's not to say that they won't surface pave Payne Road ever, but any kind of investment into that roadway, we'd have to really look at extending that sewer. It's more of an environmental concern in that area than say the, just the need to expand sewer. Okay, I, I'm, I read these notes from um, the um, town engineer and, and um, the town planner, and I'm still a little confused. Okay, we need to have a quote-unquote discussion about the installation of a low-pressure force main with future potential for each property to install a small individual pump, such as an E1 system, which is typical in many areas of town and common practice in many subdivisions and the applicant doesn't seem to be interested or willing to do that. Could you explain to me? Uh, again, Susan, if there was, right now, I've talked to the Scarborough Sanitary District and look at Public Works, I understand that there's older subdivisions out there from the 60s and 70s with failing systems. Um, I certainly appreciate that. Obviously, they were built under completely different standards than they are constructed now, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and you have failing systems. However, the Scarborough Sanitary District is the one that 
you know, looks at putting or extending sewer in, this, in the town of Scarborough. They have no plans right now. I mean, they have absolutely no plans to extend that sewer up through there. Obviously, we're going to go in and build this road and put in 12 lots. Those septic systems we're going to put in are going to be absolutely brand new. So they're certainly going to last for a number of years, a very long time, a good long time, 25 years anyway. So what is this pipe in the ground going to do? I mean, it, okay. I just, you know, we'll be 25 years from now, and then maybe as this systems fail, maybe there'll be sewer there. So then maybe we say, okay, geez, perhaps there's sewer okay. there. We'll make I a connection. I hear what you're saying. I really do, and I want to. I, I appreciate that. I think I'm going to come back to staff and say it seems like what I'm hearing from staff is that this may be a point where we make a decision. At which point do we step in and say, let's try to do something that's going to prepare us for the future? as opposed to sitting back and doing what we've always done, which is say, well, right now, this is what we have, and this is what we do, and you meet what we've always had, what we've always done, and that's fine. Do we, so I, I, I don't want to make a big deal about this, but it seems like we're drawing a line in the sand here. And I'm not saying I don't want to, dry, I don't want to draw a line in the sand either, because you know I tend to be a little liberal on these things. But would you, make, would you tell me whether what I'm saying makes sense or not? Sure, I think what you're saying is right, right on. I mean, we're we think it, there's a potential for to plan for the future on, in this area of town, and you know we we believe that sewer will be at some you know will be extended along Payne Road, and it sounds like Public Works is also supportive of that. So we're just sort of pointing out that you know in terms of a future connection, we think that we think that it makes sense. Okay, let me put it in the more political. Um, presentation. I've been on this board since Moses parted the Red Sea, and we've always talked about the fact that sewer will never cross the turnpike. Well, we know that's not true. It's going to happen. There's no doubt about it. It's going to happen. The question is when. So my question, which I don't really have an answer to, is are we at the point now where we need to, we need to start? It would be wise of us to start planning for when that happens, knowing that it's going to be sooner than later. I mean, I'm, per I'm comfortable saying that, but I don't want to be the only voice in the wilderness crying that says, okay, we're getting to that point. The development on that side of the turnpike is increasing weekly. Certainly with each of our meetings, we get more and more development coming to us on that side of the turnpike. It's not going to be that long before we need to take sewer to that side of the turnpike, but we don't know when. So I think that what we're up against here is are we willing to say we're going to start planning now for that or are we going to wait a while longer? Am I accurate in my assessment? That is the question. I that mean, is the question. doesn't have a crystal ball on this side Nobody of the Nobody does. So. Um, I, no, I, I'm not quite done. Uh, no. um, I just, Go ahead. I just wanted to in, uh, inject something sure. um, to maybe to Angela as a clarification. If in the future the town decides to put sewer down Payne Road, does that necessarily mean that this particular road would have to have a, a line going into it also? Uh, if their septic systems are working, couldn't they just up, 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 uh, hook it up to the sewer system? Do you have any idea? Is, is that a po town policy or? That would be the sewer district's policy sewer district. <laughs> on whether how much they're investing into a project to say whether they, I don't I don't think they could probably force you to, to tie into that system because it's two separate entities, the town and the sewer yeah. district. But um, as Sean said, um, as systems fail, yes, they could tie in. It would be a lot cheaper than rebuilding a septic system. Okay. I'm sorry. okay. Well, it's a lot easier, I guess, I would point out, to organize. If the pipe's already in the ground, there's a low-pressure force mean, you could do it one at a time. If you have a failing system and you got to put that down that little dead-end street, it's an investment and in whose investment to get those septic systems offline or back into the low-pressure force mean. Next question. If we should decide that we wanted that to happen with this particular development, would it not make sense that any other development that occurs along this stretch of the road would also be requested to do the same thing. In other words, we're not being saying just this um, application. I mean, there's nothing yeah. that says, right, that we have to do that. But we're setting a precedent here. 
I'm really big on setting precedents. I mean, <laughs> once you've done it, you've done it. And I've lived through precedents that have been set that I've been really sorry about. But this is one, quite frankly, to be very honest, I've been waiting for. Because I think that it's time for us to admit that that side of the turnpike is perhaps even overdue for some kind of way of dealing with all of this in a systemic way. So I'm gonna come down on the side of, there's, I, I understand that there's no guarantee that by the time it comes through, what is being done is going to be the best answer. But I think it's a step in the right direction and I'm, I hope that that makes some sense to people. Other than that, the only other um, issues I have are, um, uh, wait a minute, um, environmental subdivision submission. I guess I got that one answered. Uh, the hammerhead thing, designers should reevaluate the location of the hammerhead to avoid the larger area of wetland that is still being impacted and reconsider compressing lot seven through 12 to minimize wetland disturbance on the area. That's a different topic, is that? That's the one I was talking about, Susan, in terms of why there's some additional frontage on those two larger lots is just because of where the passing soils are. So I. You know, okay. I, the, the only, I, I, okay. if I could move that back, I would, but no. then I'd be talking about another lot. And I mean, you know, no, another, another lot. So. I understand. I don't have any real problems with that. Okay. I'm done with my comments. Oh, wait a minute. Ms. Douglas, if I could just um, maybe I understand, you know, board members uh, probably understand a little more of the context, but just for, for folks who may be tuning in for the first time, just to give maybe a little more context around Good. the uh, positioning, around <clears throat> the potential. Um, sewer line is sort of stepping back with an R2 uh, zoning subdivision. One of the provisions in the ordinance really talks about if you have an R2 subdivision that meets the threshold for conservation subdivision, um, they're required to be sewered unless the board determines that otherwise it wouldn't be feasible. And at the outset of the review of this process back in the winter, it was really that distance along Payne Road that the board generally said, okay, it doesn't seem feasible to make this developer responsible for making that sort of public connection, if you will, along Payne Road. Um, and that's really where the discussion and the consideration around the dry, the, the, um, the dry line in the, in the new road um, came into consideration was really about preparation for the future, which I know you already covered, but I just felt it would be helpful to give a little background in terms of sort of the, the zoning requirements that um, mm -hmm. conversations were spun from. Thank you. I'm, I'm done. Thank You're you. You're done? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick? Excuse, excuse me. Oh, sure. My name is Joe Fastacci. I'm the applicant. May I address a couple of Susan's concerns? Sure. There's been some talk about failing septic systems in, uh, I believe it's Heritage Acres, uh, Plymouth Pilgrim, um, I don't know the other names. Um, but as I have been informed, I believe there's only one house that had a failing system in that subdivision. It's 7 Pilgrim Road, and my son bought that house. The system had a 30-foot Orangeburg pipe wrapped in crushed rock, certainly something that was de designed prior to 1970 before they had um, plumbing codes. So that is why several of those systems may have problems. But in this particular case, uh, the first thing he did was test the system, septic system and found out why it failed. I built a house across the street several years ago, I believe it was 2008, and we installed a system, a septic system, and it has no problem. So in defense of what's in place in the area, it's working. Um, I think you had another concern. Oh, the cost, the cost for someone, even if we run the line down the street, you have to buy a, uh, an E1 system, which is in excess of $5,000, cost another maybe $2,500 to install it. Then you have to pay, if the sewer is, in, is active, then you have to pay the sewer department a pound of fl flesh, which could be somewhere <coughs> around uh, $4,000. So it's not an easy expense to just hook up to the sewer. It's probably the same amount of money as a replacement septic system would be. So just, just as... Uh, you know, for, for your information. Mm 
Mel Sandwick. Sure. Um, I appreciate the adjustments you made to the subdivision, eliminating the lots and changing some driveways around and um, <clears throat> those things. Uh, you know, as far as the dry line goes, um, do you have any idea what the overall cost of the dry line system would be? I mean, uh, I guess it depends where we start and end. If we're just talking a force main going down through there, um, uh, no, I don't, but I can certainly come up with some numbers associated with that. Um, all right. You know, I can appreciate the potential environmental impacts down the road, but um, all the lots perked, right? So, yes. Um, and perked the Scarborough standards. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, I, I, I'd like to see what the costs are associated with that dry line. I mean, if it's, if it's, uh, and then the other thing is, if we're going to, if we are going to say that this subdivision requires, we're going to require this dry line, then we need to require, require it for everybody in the week. Are we prepared to change our codes to do that? Um, because we can't do it, say we're going to make this this particular subdivision put in a dry line, um, and then the next one we're, gonna, we're not going to do that. So um, those, Sean, are those lots all the, the pumps that's required? Uh, is that because it's downhill from the sewer and every single it's it's lot? downhill from Payne Road so the anticipation would be is if the sewer system goes within Payne Road then okay. we would need individual pumps okay the systems as the septic system we're designing there may be some small <coughs> pumps associated with it depends on obviously the you know where the actual house location I did talk to Angela we did say that we will provide an overall grading plan at least an initial grading plan for the lot so that would have the driveway and the septic system and the house on there um, but obviously what we'd be talking about is a you know a septic tank going to a leach field versus in this case an e1 pump station tying into a, a low pressure force main within the street and then going up the street and tying into Payne road assuming at some point in time there'll either be a force main within Payne road or, or a gravity system within Payne road. all right so it wouldn't be Either each house would have to have its own individual pump. Correct. Or there'd be one pump for the It would be, yeah, it would certainly be, and again, the, the district these days, rather than, especially for this size development, rather than that one central station, would much rather have the individual pumps. Okay. All right. Um, I had the pleasure of having one of those pumps once, and the electrician, while he was installing the float, dropped a staple which clogged the pump and it was not fun <laughs> i fixed it myself and it was not fun it was over on cahill court um yeah you know I'm, i'd like to see what the costs are associated with that dry line uh, and i will just say we're we, gonna we, we had a quick co consultation with a local contractor <laughs> and uh his estimate was it'd be 60 to seventy thousand dollars to install the force main down the road yeah you know if all the lots perked out um i'm really not a fan of each one of those houses having to have a pump to pump uphill to the sewer uh unless we're going to make everybody do it. Um, and I don't know if that's fair either. So I appreciate the changes you made to the subdivision. Uh, I think it looks better than, than what you had proposed before. Um, I would tend to say that we don't need that dry line, but I'd like to see what the cost of it is. OK, what was, the, what was your last statement? Did you say leave it? What's that? What was the last thing you said about the dry line? I mean, if, if we're talking sixty or seventy thousand dollars, you divide that between all the lots and each lot. Yeah, I mean, if there's twelve lots, is that five thousand dollars each? I mean, if I do the math right, um, is it? I guess if if it's five thousand dollars a lot, and those lots are, it's so it's not a huge expense per lot, but it is a 
it is an added burden to those folks who are going to be looking at those houses. And um, I just like to say, if we're going to have this, if we're going to require it from this subdivision, then we should require it from every subdivision that's similar. And I personally don't think that's a good idea. But that's all I have. Okay. Um. Those, those, those septic systems are going to last 20, even if, let's say even they put in the dry line, those septic systems are going to last 25 years, what's roughly. And until someone's septic system fails, they're not going to install. It's not just, you know, when we're talking about those pumps, you've got to put in the tank. It's like a holding tank. Mm. And you've got to put in that pump. And then it's got to pump uphill. And even with that, those pumps don't last. You know, those, those depending on what your flows are into that tank, you know, those pump, pumps might have a lifespan of 10 years. Yeah, which I, is less I, than I, just to be clear, I, I do it because I think they're talking at this point of putting the force main in the road, but obviously not actually installing any pumps associated with that until such time as there ever was a, a place to connect into and we had failing septic systems. I think that was our point, is if they're 25 years down the road I and mean, we have this pipe that's in the ground, everyone else is getting brand new sewer. Shouldn't we put a brand new sewer in to take care of this road with everybody else? That, you know, but if, so you have have a failing a if you have a failing system and the dry line's in the road, you still have to put in the <coughs> pump, right? Yes. The first thing you have to buy is the E1 pump station. Uh, plumb up your house, obviously, so it's going into the pump station, and then that tie that pump station into the dry line that would be within the road. Yeah, I think it's a. I think it's going to be a burden on the people that are looking at buying those houses, and I'm not sure that it's necessary. But um, you know, if we're on if we're on the edge, I don't. Staff knows better than I if we're on the edge of adversely affecting that whole ecosystem. So that's all I have. Okay, Richard. Yeah, I have uh, one of those pumps, um, and I've actually not had a problem with it, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was in the house good. when we bought it. No, no, I'll that's say good. That. Uh, Sean, I, I was concerned with something that you said, and I'm going to quote it pretty closely. I'm going to wait for failure of systems before we do anything about it. Um, I, I don't think that that's actually very good planning is to wait until something fails. No, Rachel, let me, I think we need I think you misquoted me there somewhat. I was saying that if these systems are all in place, these people buy the house, the system's in place. If the sewer comes in five years from now, all right, and they're not going to say, okay, those systems that you have in place are now, that's it, you got to tie into the sewer. I would anticipate at least that the, they have a system that works at that point in time, that the sanitary district's comment to them or proposal to them would be is, once your system fails, that's when you have to make connection into the system. That would be my anticipation. That has nothing to do with us in terms of that regard. I'm just saying in terms of no. when the sanitary district would require them to actually make that physical connection to the sewer, if in fact Actually, it's that wasn't the context. Um, so I'm inclined to say that we need the force main system down the street. I think um, I remain concerned about uh, minor changes. Let me see if I can quote uh, what you folks said here correctly. Um, you said, based upon the o overall watershed area for Tucker Brooks, we anticipate insignificant downstream impacts due to the proposed minor increases. In other words, there are still increases, even though you think they're insignificant in terms of the impact. We have a lot of development going down where what we see is just a constant increase of insignificant impact and minor increases until we'll end up hitting a problem. Uh, we have brooks out there that are um, in the damaged that are in danger. And to me, any increase in the water, uh, any increase in storm water, any minor increase uh, is not acceptable. Um, minor increases eventually add up to large increases. So I would be inclined to say that we need to see the force main in there 
and I would like to see uh, what else you have to say about handling the stormwater for the next presentation to us. Well, under that scenario, Rachel, obviously that's what we'll have to do is, all I'm saying is at some point, and again, these hills, these lots are on the downhill side of the road. Mm -hmm. So it's in terms of trying to get that water from those lots and into that pond or some other method in terms of detaining that water. That's what we're talking about at this point in time is de detention, not, mm -hmm. not treatment associated with that. I, I just always look at the model that we base this stuff on. Uh, somehow it seems to me that, you know, we're chasing uh, small numbers, if you will, and I appreciate exactly what you're saying. I totally understand what everybody's saying in terms of incremental increases from a number of projects lead, obviously they add up and lead to a, 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 a decent increase at some point in the future. I'm just saying that we have a model that associates with this that again is for a residential development that we're talking about an increase statistically or based upon the, the computations from the model uh, of one CFS going into a 700 acre watershed. And yes, I do. Personally, I view that as insignificant. I view that within uh, uh, the, uh, the vagaries of the model itself, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but, you know, we told Angela what we do is an overall grading plan associated with that. Uh, we're going to do a grading plan of each one of the lots, and obviously based upon that, uh, we'll get more water to go to that pond, and we'll get that, we'll get that number down to zero. All right, and I'm looking at uh, your statement that it's uh, 0.54 CFS for the 10-year storm event, 1.65 CFS for the 25-year storm event. Given the climate changes that we see, the 25-year storm event is going to most likely become a lot more frequent than we've seen in the past. So uh, thank you for your uh, willingness to work on this. Okay. Um, Sean, just for clarification, um, I'm looking at lots one through six. Those are the ones that would potentially need a, an individual pumps <coughs> the south side? Uh, uh, the whole road goes down yeah. relatively significantly from Payne Road. So okay. if, if sewer is put in within Payne Road, all of those lots will basically require perhaps the first, the corner lots, perhaps not, but every other lot will require a pump. E even lots uh, 8 through uh, 7 through 12? Uh, yes, those, again, those just... are on the upside. Of the, of they're on the upside of our road, yeah. but they're on the downhill side of Payne Road. All right, so, so the sewer oh, system's in Payne Road. So this whole thing is below Payne Oh, Road. absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we have, yes, we, right. And of course, the existing sewer is about 3,000 feet away, as we discussed right, originally. Yeah, so. <laughs> Joe um, just wanted me to make sure I pointed that out. I, I'm kind of torn on, on this particular thing myself. Um, but... I, I guess, see, I, I think I, you could, I could see this as a selling point to these lots if you had the dry, the dry, um, no? Because maybe potentially they're going to need something, you know, especially if sewer goes down Payne Road, I would think it would be a very attractive option for the homeowners. I, I shake my head. Uh, as I indicated, you have to buy the E1 pump, then you have to install it. Then you have to pay the sewer department a fee. So you're looking between ten and twelve thousand dollar expense. So if a home buyer is looking at a potential of twelve thousand additional outlay, even though he has a functional septic system, I think that would be a negative factor. That's why I say no. Okay. But someone else could have a you know a more positive opinion. Um, the the other question I had, and maybe this should be directed to Angela. Um, you know the um, the concern with the Beaver, the Beaver Brook. Where is it? You know that watershed. Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, down below that open space, the wetlands, isn't that the Flaherty's farm? Is that Flaherty's farmland? Uh, well, you, uh, and again, I don't know where Flaherty's farmland ends and stops, to be honest with you, but I think they're on both sides of the road. I think they have that, that, that barn that does the, yeah. the, the, the events now. That's a Flaherty. Well, it may not be the kind of... But right, where Flaherty obviously I'm just has their farm stand and, and yeah. the culvert underneath it where the stream is. That's where basically everything's going yeah. to. 
I, I'm just wondering how much more is going to be developed on from there down toward Flaherty Farm. You know, I mean, do you, do you have any sense is that all buildable or is that just just farmland? Uh, I'm not entirely certain. Okay. I because that seems to me to be a pretty significant water, you know, wetland area there for the concerns that you raised. You know, I, I recognize we've had problems with um, developments piggybacking on other developments and um, incurring further water problems, you know, so. Uh, well, it's, yeah, well, it's the accumulation of the entire watershed. Mm. And so this is, again, pointed out as from DEP as potential for development and that's why it's specifically on the list for, for the threatened priority list. Are, are you satisfied with the, um, they talked about a 20 foot drainage easement? Um, that was something that we worked back and forth on. It's about really about the, the flows coming from above them and making sure they're directed where they should be. Okay, um, so going above lots seven over here, okay. All right. So we're not. All right. So then that water is directed, basically down around. You have to accommodate the flows coming onto your site, not sure. just putting a barrier or a berm or something oh, yeah, to flood yeah. out those above you. It's basically essentially what that's about. I see. Okay. Well, like, um, and and we're uh, is staff basically. Uh, are you satisfied with the um, his explanation for the hammerhead re remaining where it is? Is that okay? I, I, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> without having more information, I guess, in, in terms of but other passing test pits. Yeah, because it sounds like they've got a soil problem on so, some of those lots. So the ordinance sort of speaks to minimizing wetlands, yeah. um, but for where the board finds that there's no practical alternative. So I guess i turn it sort of back to the board, and do you feel that you have enough information to uh, determine that there is no practical alternative? Okay, I, I guess um, I, I guess the um, you know uh, you know uh, based on what Rick asked you about the, the potential costs and everything of, associated with that, I think that's the thing that's still up in the air. I have nothing else further to add. <coughs> any other questions? You have any? You have any? Well, I was kind of, to be honest with you, Mr. Chairman, I was kind of hoping we could uh, work our way through a couple of these items. I was actually hoping for a vote tonight on a preliminary subdivision approval, perhaps with the conditions of regarding the force main. Again, if I need to get you more information, we can push that off to the next meeting. Uh, I think I understand, obviously, the peak rates of runoff, that I have to maintain those at, uh, at pre-developed rates. Um, and I think we kind of hopefully adjust the hammerhead. So. Uh, those were the three main issues I saw. I, I certainly saw everything else is certainly uh, very uh, things we could take up between preliminary and final. So that's what we were hoping for was yeah. to actually get a vote from you folks tonight if if the board was comfortable with that. Well, it's, it's going to. In response to that, I don't have any problems with any other parts of what's being presented to us this mm -hmm. evening. In other words, the issues seem to have been worked out, and I think that you've been. Um, aware of what we were concerned about and have, and have taken steps in that direction. I do think that this particular issue is one that's going to have to be dealt with and we might as well dealt, deal with it right here. And so I'm not willing to make a, a motion to make a vote to say okay until somehow or another, and I guess we need staff um, guidance or I personally need staff guidance on what to do about this because this is it is different it is new and I can understand why it might be something that actually has to be taken into an ordinance form I say with a question in my voice well I, I think the board can deal with this application before you without delving into ordinance so again you know this board's job in terms of reviewing the application okay. is based on the merits of the existing ordinance not to sort of reinvent okay. the ordinance so, as we go through the process so I would so how can we take care of the fact that we are obviously as a board very concerned about this yeah. and we see this as a step that has to not be ignored but be taken into consideration for future impact and not make this particular applicant have to pay the full price when nobody else has had to? 
because that's how I'm feeling, is that it's not fair to say you need to step in where nobody else has stepped in. But on the other hand, I feel this is critical mass. You know, I mean, we've been, we've been, we, we've been skirting around this. We have paid no, we, we've paid attention, but we haven't really done anything about it. Mm -hmm. So it's time. And I would like to have you as staff say that you will help us take this on in a way that is a ordinance yep. answer, okay, because the ordinance doesn't say at this particular point that this is anything that they have to do. If that is something that you can interact with me on, then I would be willing to say, all right, fine. They will respond to the issues as they come up, and that's okay. But we've got to do something about the fact that this is not going to last forever. Okay, so I think if what I'm hearing you say is, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, tell me if I, I, I'm reading okay. what you're, I'm, what you're I, saying. I don't know what I'm saying, so you tell me. I, and it, so I think what I'm hearing for this application, <clears throat> per your suggestion, is that maybe we don't need to think about the, 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 the uh, dry line, the sort of the line at this point, but that you'd like the board's sort of concerns on this matter to be raised to the, to uh, to become an issue that the town looks at um, in yeah. terms of um, future regulations, ordinances, policies, what have you. And so I think in that regard, so a couple of ways that that can happen. One, uh, two members on this board are on the Long Range Planning Committee, so can bring that through that process. Also, I would suggest um, that, you know, as the board works its way through applications, again, we already sort of talked about it's not the appropriate time to review the merits of an ordinance when we have an application before us, because that's you know, your job is to review, review that application. But what I would say is when you do come across these issues, another uh, appropriate measure would be to make your council liaison aware of the concerns and, and bring it to the, the, that, that level to see um, if that's something that they want the town to spend I think that that's what I'm, I think on. that's what I'm looking for, yep. because quite frankly, it was staff that brought this to our full attention. I mean, that's your job, is to point out to us that this, is, this may have an impact above and beyond what we've seen before. And I don't want to just let this whole thing just go. But I don't want this applicant to have to bear the full brunt of it. Yep. So what I'd like to do is just say, I'm trusting you, staff members, to figure out the best way and report back to us, thank you very much, maybe on the very next meeting we have, as to what steps have been taken to, a, to take a look at and address what, is, what seems to be like a tsunami. That's what I'm looking at right now, okay? With that in mind, then I don't have any problems with let, not having this particular applicant be um, the spot where we say, okay, we're going to take a draw a line in the sand here because that's really not our job. We don't get a, we don't we don't even have the response. We don't even have the power to do that. I would like to think we did, but we don't. But I think that we've made the point that you know this is it. This is where we think as a board that this has got to stop and um, help us figure out how to do that. Yep. And other than that. I think it's up to the chair to figure out how to now I'll figure it out. address it. All right. um, let me uh, over across the across Payne Road. Is that all developed right now? Do you know? Uh, so across Payne Road, there is a subdivision. Um, you actually, you can see it right here. Okay. Um, yeah. And then Regal, Regal Pines. Regal Pines. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it isn't Beaverbrook uh, subdivision down in there somewhere too? Eva Brooks subdivision. I, mean, I don't know where that is, to be honest with you. Am I, am I thinking of the wrong I road? think you're in the wrong um, place. As you come down Payne Road, as was stated, you're sort of headed downhill towards oh, Flaherty. Right. So on the opposite side yeah. of Payne Road, it's yeah. really largely undeveloped land yeah. uh, for the most part. Um, right. you, if you're coming down this way, then Scotto Hill Road meets right down through here. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so you say very little and, development, basically, from that, that um, cul-de-sac down south. Yes, actually, there's fight. This, well, <laughs> it's, uh, we've looked at the land across the street too. That's a pretty tough piece of property we'd have to look at as well. But yeah, yeah. it's it, but it is undeveloped as it sits right now. 
I'm, uh, I, I can't, I don't know what to say on this. Um, I, I tend to agree with Sue's latest statement. I hate to see you guys, you know, s stuck with this in a way, you know, but I understand it, it's already in the ordinance, right, on, on the, um, in this particular uh, zone, uh, the R2, that if there's going to be a development and it's a conservation subdivision, it should be on sewers. Correct. It's already in. So it's yeah. not, so we'd be basically having to uh, make a, amending that basically to waive that. Uh, no, so so again, sort of as I said, what the the R two ordinance says is when you have a conservation subdivision in the R two district, um, that it's to be served by the sewer, the public uh, sewer system, unless the board finds that um, uh, it's not feasible or reasonably or a reasonable alternative. And the board had prior discussions back in the winter um, that connecting to the public sewer was was found not to be a reasonable expectation given the um, distance right. um, and, and other issues associated with the with the development. But um, so so we the board sort of already dealt with that issue. I mean, at this point, it sounds like the majority of the board, I think, is okay with not having them put the dry line in. I think the other issue, and I believe I've heard uh, Mr. Frank talk about he's going to work a little harder to address it, has to do with the peak flow runoff, um, and he'll look at getting that rate down to um, um, current or we'll get it down to zero. Get it down to zero? Um, yes. So it sounds like you know, if the board were so inclined and comfortable with the direction things are headed, that a preliminary approval with the condition that they continue to work on their stormwater management approach be um, might be in order, um, unless there's other issues I'm forgetting about. Okay. What's what's the pleasure of the board of regarding that? Yes, that's that. <clears throat> Rick? We're just looking for preliminary subdivision approval, right? Just we're preliminary looking at preliminary. Approval. We'll come back to this. I point. think at this point, we're, I think we have enough information for preliminary subdivision. Okay. Approval pending, they're going to, you know, and it, realizing that they're going to get back to us with the stormwater. So I think I have enough information for preliminary subdivision. How do you feel, Rachel? I'm fine. Um, I, I guess I need to uh, consult with our planners over there. Um, if we grant preliminary subdivision, is that the end of the conversation around the force main? Uh, I, I would think, by and large, it, that this... That would be would, the end of would, it? Unless the board put a condition that you want to see additional information on that item. But at this point, the applicants' materials have said they don't intend to put one in. So unless you condition that you want to see additional information as was suggested to make that determination, then I would say it's put to bed. If you want that issue to still remain, then that I, could be an item. I that need that issue to still remain. I'm fine with um, going ahead and giving them preliminary with the idea that they're going to be coming back for an additional review. I think I made my opinion pretty clear. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> then the motion is? There's no motion. Yet. Okay. There is no motion. Okay. So do we have to vote? If someone is so desires to make a motion, then that, that, That's what see. I meant. <laughs> that's where we're at. It would seem. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion and put grant preliminary subdivision approval. I'll second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those approved? Three, one, not approved, one. Okay. Well, thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate it. We really do. I know, I know we seem to go back and forth a little bit on it, and I apologize for that. But uh, thank you for your time. We do appreciate it. Great stuff. Item number six, uh, Sonnenstein, is it Sonnenstein? Realty, LLC, uh, Portland Volvo requests a site plan amendment review for a new automobile dealership at 9 U.S. Route 1, assesses map U50, lot 18. I don't think they're the ones that should have to All right. 
Okay. I'll kick it off. Uh, just to remind the board, this uh, proposal is located in the Business Office Research, or BOR, zoning district at 9 U.S. Route 1, uh, close to the South Portland city line. Uh, the applicant is proposing to demolish the existing uh, building on the site um, and replace it with a 23,850 square foot building. Uh, the applicant was last before the board in March for a sketch plan review. Uh, motor vehicle sales, repair, and service <laughs> facilities are permitted use in the BOR district, given they were in existence as of September 1, 2007, which this site has been. The zoning ordinance requires a 25-foot landscape or nat naturally vegetated buffer along the front property line when fronting Route 1. In addition, the design standards require parking lots to be separated from the street using plantings, berms, and other landscape elements to minimize the view of vehicles in the lot. There appears to be an opportunity to provide additional tree plantings along the southernmost and northernmost portions along the Route 1 frontage. The BOR zone requires enhanced side and rear yard setbacks and buffering when abutting residential districts. The existing conditions on the site do not meet the 50-foot buffer along the southern property line where it abuts the R2 <coughs> zoning district. This is a grandfathered non-conforming buffer currently. The board should discuss opportunities to enhance and augment the existing buffer on the site. And uh, staff recommends that the applicant preserve or relocate the existing buffer trees instead of replacing them with younger and shorter trees to ensure the existing buffer is maintained. <coughs> Staff also recommends that house side shields be used on the light fixtures uh, adjacent to the residential properties. The applicant has indicated that around 10,000 square feet of the building will be used for retail and services and use the square footage to calculate the required parking on the site. However, the applicant did not provi provide a floor plan of the proposed building to confirm this. Staff recommends that the applicant explain the parking calculations to the board and provide a floor plan of the building as well to confirm this. Staff questions whether the proposed snow storage area on the site has enough capacity for the entire site. The board should be sure to discuss this as well. The town's design standards prohibit overhead doors from being located on any facade facing a public street or a residential neighborhood. It appears that two overhead doors are proposed to face Route 1 in the project. The applicant should discuss if any other design alternatives were explored so overhead doors were not oriented towards Route 1. There also appears to be an opportunity to provide more windows and fenestration along the building facade <laughs> facing Route 1. And typically prior to an approval, the board has had the opportunity to review the building materials and colored renderings of the building. The applicant should provide this to the board prior to final approval. The board typically also reviews a site rendering that includes the proposed landscaping to ensure that the trees and plantings are coordinated with the on-site architecture and to ensure that the required 25 buffer strip is adequate. So the applicant should provide this to the board as well. And the applicant, finally, the applicant should give the board an update on the status of their main DEP permit. Because <coughs> it wasn't in, approved when they provided the application. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kylie Mason. I'm here tonight uh, with the architect and the owner's rep uh, for uh, Portland Volvo. Um, I think each of them will come up in turn as needed to present or answer questions. But just to give a quick orientation on the plan. Uh, so just to give a quick uh, orientation, this is Route 1 uh, here. The current building is located in this location. Uh, there's three curb cuts currently. Uh, we're proposing to remove one of them. Um, as you'll recall from earlier meetings, uh, when Sean Frey, I think we escaped, uh, presented, uh, the building is largely the same. It hasn't uh, changed. And at that time, there was no comment or concern about the overhead doors. And, and I think that's one item that we'd like to uh, talk about right away, is that it's consistent with the other uses along Route 1, uh, same uses, uh, automobile, uh, sales, uh, we've provided pictures in the packet, and while uh, this is not uh, individually in a contract zone, it certainly suits um, the use and it can be done in an attractive manner. Uh, to answer Jamel's question, um, alternatives were examined, but as you can imagine, car dealerships and service are um, very fine-tuned uh, in terms of how they receive vehicles and how they move them through. Um, we're also facing some logistics in that. 
uh, the existing building needs to maintain operation uh, while the new one is being built so that they can move right into the new building and then demolish the existing building. So um, the architect is here and can discuss any of those finer points. Um, in terms of the landscaping, uh, we're putting back the trees that we're taking out. I think um, given that the arborvitaes that are existing in place um, are quite large, I know Susan's favorite plant, um, we probably would not want to have a tree spade, pick those up and put them back down. Um, if you would like some additional understory plantings, we can do that. There is a wooden um, fence along the property line. So any of the buffering that we're talking about is largely canopy. Um, so we can talk about adding some deciduous trees if what we want to do is add additional canopy to it. Um, but we are proposing nine new trees. Uh, and those are eight to 10 foot wide. Uh, in terms of the front landscaping, uh, as you'll all recall, uh, Volvo has a pretty uh, substantial perennial and shrub um, placement around the sign. Uh, we've provided photos of those in the packet. We are not proposing any additional landscaping, mainly because we're not disturbing that existing landscaping around the sign. Um, however, where uh, the frontage is on Route 1 and where we've taken out the uh, entrance, we are proposing to add more landscaping. We are adding additional ornamental trees, uh, a mixture of ornamental grasses, and some additional plantings uh, at the entrance. Um, I guess to address the north corner here, uh, that actually gets into what is a drainage easement. There's a large weeping willow, as I think you're probably familiar with right here. And then the remainder of it is a drainage easement that um, the town of Scarborough has. So I, I think you would probably not want us to put additional trees in that area. I, th I think that it's, um, it's got a steep slope. I, I don't know that it adds much to the corridor itself. Um, but we can certainly talk about it if, that, if that's... Um, important. We did meet with the fire department today. Um, they were satisfied with the turning movements. Uh, we are going to move a hydrant uh, over into this area. Um, and I think everything is good there. Um, we can follow up with comments um, for the next meeting. From a DEP standpoint, uh, the application is still in review. We've sent back our comment responses uh, to Ben Viola and um, Bob. Uh, green from DEP, so uh, nothing outstanding that we think will be, it'll just be the review and submission for signatures. In terms of the floor plan, we did bring a color-coded uh, floor plan and pass it out. What we did do is um, we inventoried the sale area, general offices, and actually included the parts and storage in our 10,000 square foot calculation. Sorry, I only brought one. Hmm. But we can provide additional copies for you in our in our next submission. Um, let's see. In terms of lighting, house side <coughs> shields, as you all know, LED lights are directional lighting. Uh, they do have house side protection, but they do not have house side shields. So um, we can ensure that the light will not trespass over the property line, as shown in the photometrics. Um, we can also ensure that the directional light is pointed in the method that it should towards the parking. Um, and we can add house side protection, but there are no more house side shields. Um, and we think those were the big, I guess the big concerns, but I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. And we do have a number of renderings that we can bring up um, to talk about landscaping or building facade and materials. want anybody else to do any presentation? Do you want us to do that first? Yeah? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, do you want to go to public comment? There's a period of public comment here if anybody um, wants to. Okay. Let me, I'll, I'll put it up there. Okay. <laughs> so um, I guess just to present, this would be from the Route 1 corridor. So this would be from the Route 1 corridor. Um, this would be the existing sign. Um, as best as you can illustrate existing landscaping with photo simulation. Uh, there's probably not that many alliums on the site. Um, but the other entrance would be down here. As you approach, you reach the second entrance. As you are familiar, the third entrance would be closed as you come down. So this would be the new dealership. Um, 
as you can tell, I, I think it's quite attractive. I'm a Scarborough resident, but um, certainly if you guys don't like it, then we have some work to do. Um, but we did provide a count, um, and I know Susan will be very familiar with uh, the Mercedes dealership and the landscaping there. This has substantially more landscaping than that dealership, uh, even in place currently. So what we're adding to is, is pretty substantial already. I think um, one of our landscape architects provided a count of 557 daylilies, a number of shrubs, um, lots of ornamental trees. We're adding to that. So uh, hopefully you'll find that pleasing in your review. And you'll all forgive me, I'm not an architect, so I don't even play a good one. Um, so the building uh, is a standing seam metal bu building, um, aluminum storefront, window glazing, um, and I'm hopefully not butchering this too much, but it does have some glass along the front, um, a blue, I guess a blue um, glazing on the Volvo sign itself, but I think this is probably not as demonstrative as this. And I think what's important is the view of the overhead doors and how they can be very attractive and provide a little break in the facade itself. Um, you want me to bring it closer so you can see? Can I pull it up? So I think if it, I think that's probably as close as I'm going to get to materials, but I can answer anything that you might have. Okay, now, um, does any public want to make a comment? State your name. State your name and address, please. My name is John Eide. I'm the abutting property owner to Portland Volvo. Um, yeah. It's my hatchet. I've given Mr. Torres and Mr. Chase all the documentation about, what, two weeks ago of, how do I politely say this, a huge mistake that the staff at um, Scarborough made. My house was, or my property was Business Highway when I bought it in 91. The town council changed that to R2 in 92. When Portland Volvo went ahead with the expansion plans, which everybody knew was going to happen in 02, Sipniewski in a meeting on December 2nd of 02 indicated that the abutting property owners were residential. On December 11th, Joe, um, Dave Grisk said that they were BH and not R2. As a result, um, Portland Volvo has a 30 foot buffer rather than the 100 foot buffer that they should have had and you're grandfathering in that 30-foot buffer as opposed to the new 50-foot buffer. There's some reasons for buffers, and let me outline some of the reasons with Portland Oval. Uh, lighting. When they opened in 03, I could sit on my couch where I normally sit at night and read, and I could have all the lights off in my house and I could read from the lights spilling in from Portland Oval. Um, the new building now is, I don't know, new building is uh, 250 feet closer. There are two spot, currently there are two spotlights on the side of Portland Oval facing my house the new plans indicate there will be three. Um, that's the primary culprit in allow or benefit in allowing me to read from my house. Currently, the closest light pole, the front of my house, is 140 feet that way. When they get done, the current light pole will be 30 feet from the R2 proper line. 140 feet down to 30 feet. Uh, 
Um, you probably assume that Portland Volvo opens at 7 in the morning and closes at 6 at night. There's activity that goes on 24 hours a day there. One of them is car carriers. Car carriers come in anytime during the 24 hour period. Uh, one of my indications of the state of our economy is how many car carriers come in there in a day and a week. When the economy is bad, they may get one a week. When the economy is good, they may get four a day. Car carriers have come in at three in the morning. On a hot summer night with all the windows open, a car carrier comes in at three in the morning. It's very noisy. There's a, the diesel engine is running. And there are two occasions my house has been filled with diesel fumes because they have unloaded the car down in the edge of where the buffer should have been. You would also be surprised at the number of dead Volvos that are dragged into that place on a daily basis. Tow companies come in from sunrise to midnight and drop off dead cars to be fixed. That's very noisy. Um, you'd also be surprised <laughs> at the number of new Volvos that come off those carriers with dents in them. They bring in an outside contractor who does the work down inside where that 100-foot buffer should have been. And all day long. I think this has gone now. There used to be an alloy real repair guy that would come in and do the work there, down toward, well, where the 100-foot buffer should have been. I think he does that off-site now, so I'm not going to deal with that. If you look at the record, or if you look at the, the documentation I gave Mr. Torres and Mr. Chase, Chase I'm sorry, um, the neighbors in 02 talked about the amount of noise from the PA system. Hugh, if you have a line on call two, two Hugh. The other thing that went on, which is sort of funny, but not. <laughs> Old Volvos, as you recall, used to be square boxes that were either gray or silver. And now at least they're colors. The guy would come out with a worksheet, and he'd see nothing but gray Volvo wagons, and he would hit the panic button on the key ring. And that would go off all day long, the lights and the horn, the alarm horn. Since Volvos have gotten more colorful, that's happening less. Um, one thing I'm very curious about, Mr. Torres said that you people don't want overhead doors on the south side facing the residents. One of the things that bothers us, every one of my neighbors has talked about this, and that is uh, the tire changing station, which now faces us. And that's going to come, right now the building is 325 feet away. We hear that air hammer from 7 in the morning to 6 at night, six days a week. And you've heard what an air hammer is like when they change tires. That's now going to be 215 feet closer to us. The dumpster. They're moving the dumpster. That comes at sunrise. It is extremely noisy, surprisingly noisy. That is now... I forget the distance. I didn't write that down. Beg them to keep the dumpster where it is and not bring it closer to the residences down here. Um, finally, there's some real discrepancies between what's said in here and what's indicated on these maps. And if you look at sheet three, if you look at sheet three, you'll see a number of X's across the existing trees. Those are trees they want to take out. Yeah, you can see them up there. All those trees they want to take out and they want to remove them. Right where his arrow was at the top, those trees are now 15, 20 feet high. They have finally, after 12, 10, 12 years, blocked that light that I could read with. 
They're going to take those trees out and they're going to replace them with eight, ten foot trees. I beg you to ask them to leave those trees there. There's no reason to take those trees out. Um, Exhibit 1D5, page 4, says that existing trees and other landscaping will be preserved. 1F2, page 5, existing vegetation and tree clusters have been retained and will be preserved. Um, 1F10, page 6, existing vegetative buffing shield structures and uses from, I'm reading this from their notes. Um, view from abutting properties. 1F12, page 6, there's existing vegetative buffering that will be enhanced by the installation of new planting. But yet, when you look at sheet 3, you see they're taking those trees out. And if you look at sheet 13, you'll see that they're planting them or replacing them with small trees, not the big ones. It's going to take another 10, 12 years for those trees to grow back up to buffer our, our property from the light spill. Um, I have another question about the light. And if you look at the map, that's the chart that's up there right now. You can see the little black dots. Yep. Those are lights. They are right on inside the 50-foot buffer. They're on the 30-foot point. Those lights, as I said before, the closest one is 140 feet from me. Not from the property line, I'm sorry. The, the closest one when they get done will be 30 feet from the R2 property line. I've lived next to these, this place for, well, since 91. I've lived next to it since they opened in 03. There is really no need for 11 light fixtures between that facade and um, <coughs> the edge of the parking. In that area right now, you see between the building there are five light posts. Those five light posts do more than an adequate amount <clears throat> of lighting for that property. Uh, you'll see, on, maybe not on that one, on another one, you'll see the three spotlights that are on the side of that building. Um, I don't know what those spotlights are going to be for in addition to the 11 posts they have. Um, they don't need that much lighting. I can assure you from looking out there almost every night. Um, finally, it, it, Mr. Tory said that they didn't want any roll-up doors facing a residential thing. I would be happy with that. I would be more than happy, as, long, as well as my neighbors, to not face that tire-changing bay anymore. Uh, so we don't have to listen to that. That's a complaint from all the neighbors around me. Um, it was said that there is a wooden fence on the property line. No, there's not a wooden fence on the property line. There's a wooden fence that's 17 feet in from the R2 property line. It's my fence. It's my neighbor's fence. Um, that doesn't do anything to buffer any of the noise or any of the, the light. Um, leave the trees. I don't know. I'm sorry. That's about all I can uh, say. Thank you. No. <laughs> I, knew we I want to paraphrase some comments that you people made three weeks ago. Most of this was around um, the Land Rover Jaguar dealership thing. I'm paraphrasing what you seven members of the board for today. We will look carefully at what the ordinance says. Follow the zone ordinance. Must have buffering. Buffering is very important. A visual buffer is important. Do you need all that parking? We don't want car dealerships on Route 1. We represent the people of Scarborough. So thank you. You have 30 seconds, he took up one. <laughs> I live here, you can't see my house, but I live right over there. Um, I do a lot of business with Volvo. I drive a Volvo, I get all my car sticks. Oh, and you name are? an address, please. Lisa Gestopolis, 7 River, 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 Riverview Place. I think Volvo is a great neighbor. 
for the most part. I'm scared to death about the lights. I, I don't want my property value to go down because the net, when I decide to sell it, it's going to be like the second coming of Christ in my backyard. Um, the trees and the plantings that are there are finally doing their job. They're finally getting high enough that it is blocking. I mean, I still see Volvo um, it, it, in, in the night, but those trees are working and they're doing their jobs and they're beautiful. So I don't believe that any of those should be taken down if I had my, if I had my say. I did see in one of the plans that they were planning on planting some white pines. I have trouble with white pines because they get really big and tall and they lose everything down below. So they're not going to do the job that, that, that we need them to do. I think buffering is important. I think, you know, we've been good neighbors and um, I'd like to see Volvo take us into account with the lights and the plantings. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. I should have said I have no argument with Portland Volvo. I really <laughs> no, I'm, they're great neighbors. But thank you. my argument with Scarborough from... Thank you. Anybody else from the public wish to speak? Okay. Um, Rick, could you start us off? Sure. I'm not going to talk about landscaping because I'm sure Susan's going to cover that. <laughs> For us. Although the picture you have is very nice. Oh, thank you. I can't take credit for it. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about lights and noise because that seems what everybody else wants to talk about. That sounds great. So let's start with let's start with noise. Um, I'm looking at the new design, and I heard something about there's not going to be any doors on that side. So. <laughs> I guess I'm thinking noise might go down or yeah. stay the same. Yeah, I think that might be one of the easiest ones to answer. So, and I think you guys have this in your packet, but if not, we'll get you a smaller copy. Okay. So, the doors at the front um, are really a reception. So, it's where you bring your cars in so that they can wait to be serviced. So, no more cars parked under a carport to be driven around and into the side bays. But more importantly, the way the side bays are, are set up, so right now what he's talking about is when you look at it, you look right underneath the car and you can hear the air hammer. But now it's a, it's a long service area, so really what you would see is you would just be looking at a corridor, if anything at all, and all of the lifts are well within inside the building. So it's a very different setup than if you were going this way and you could really only access from both sides, which is what they're currently doing. So this gives a very long orientation. It allows them to bring the cars in uh, and then service them. Uh, so no more air hammer or staring at the other side of the car uh, from the residences. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, excuse me. Sorry. Um, so, it sounds like this expansion is not going to create any more noise than what's already there. So, the right, okay. definitely not any more. And then the, I understand, you know, what we're talking about tonight is the expansion, not the overall what, you know, whether Volvo should be there or not. Um, okay, let's talk about lights. So you're going to use. LEDs, which is going to be a little bit different light than, than what is existing. Um, are there, do you, are you going to put a system in, or I assume that there's going to, they can, they're going to dim these lights at night? Yeah, so, so, that right, don't so have, in so the packet, we described them as um, the auto dimming at, um, at night uh, when they're closing, but more importantly, um, the one kind of single pole mount with the four fixtures on it that's currently in the parking lot. I think the, there's a couple, you know, they're within the, the footprint itself. It's a, it's a hugely tall fixture. I won't even wager a guess at how tall, but it's, it's huge and it's casting light across an entire parking lot. The benefit of the LEDs and the, and the intent of the LEDs is that you use more in a smaller elevation with directional lighting and it's a softer glow that's not casting into your neighbor's Right. so they can read by it. 
So if anything, the lighting should be dramatically improved because we don't have high poles casting broad light everywhere we can. Right. Uh, and then after hours, they'll auto dim. In terms of the building mounted lights, those aren't spotlights, as, as you know, they're just building mounted lights, um, at, mounted at doors uh, for egress. Okay. So I'm looking at the photometric plan and the fixtures uh, and the profiles look like that they're going to cut the light off pretty significantly yes. at the um, borders of the lot. Yes. Uh, do the lights that are on site now currently dim at all? Or I, don't I don't think they do because I've driven by them there. Yeah. I drive yeah. by there on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. And it always seems just as bright. So um, the noise is going to stay the same or get better. From what I can see, it looks like it's going to get better. And using cutoff fixtures, LEDs, and dimming profiles, the lighting looks like it's going to get significantly better Yes. than what's there. Yes. So. Looking through the package and all the information that you provided and the comments back, it looks like you've addressed most all the comments that staff and um, the peer reviewers had. The noise is going to get better or less, and the lighting is going to get significantly better from this photometric plan. Um, What's the dimming? So it's right now it's seven to six. So do you have any idea what the dimming? They're gonna they're gonna dim it when they close. Probably. Yeah, when they close. Um, I, yeah. I think the goal was to put them on. Um, yeah, and they can dim the time. residential side more. I would hope, you know, to drive by there in the future and see that the residential side is dimmed as much as it. Yeah, I would think be. that the residential side can probably be dimmed to a level that it provides security and safety. Correct. Um, at, but doesn't need to sell a vehicle at right. three o'clock in the morning. Okay. All right. Well, based on that uh, feedback and the responses to the comments that you provided, um, I think it's better than what's there. So I don't have any issues with it. Rachel? I have a question for our planners. Uh, the prior gentleman uh, stated that he believed that um, because it is a brand new, and I'm probably, I'm paraphrasing, because this is a brand new building, it might not therefore be considered an existing uh, situation in terms of the buffer. Was that grandfathered in? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think one of the easier ways to maybe describe and talk about it is, I think when you read about the, the 25 foot um, Route 1 streetscape buffer, it, says specifically that it should be um, maintained or established when anything comes through for site plan review. And so that very clearly articulates that if there's an existing <coughs> nonconformity when someone comes in for a redevelopment, that, that that's an area that is required to become uh, into conformance. There's not that similar language in terms of the side yard setbacks and, and that buffering, so that really is considered a grandfather non-conformity, but again, plan board still does have the ability to ensure that adequate buffering is in place where, you know, where appropriate and, and, and feasible, so. Uh, okay, um, the, let me address a little bit on the landscaping, and that is in terms of the front landscaping um, from that, if you can put the design back up, please, thank you. While the sign certainly is beautifully landscaped, um, the rest of the landscaping in front along Route 1 is kind of sparse. Uh, we've requested in other places that they indicated that a berm would be good, that continuous planting would be good, and I would suggest that you take a look at some additional landscaping along Route 1. Now, in terms of the buffering on the side of the residences, uh, you are going to be taking out those trees, is that correct? We are taking out those trees. 
Well, yeah, that's, because that's, we're grading, that's my question. Because we're grading into that area. So uh, if you were to look at, and I think this might actually answer your Well, uh, then let, wait, wait, just let me go back. Why are you grading into that area? Why are we grading into that area? So I guess the easiest way to answer that would be um, because we are pulling a section of the parking lot uh, towards the back. Uh, the grading for that parking lot impacts the trees. They wouldn't survive um, the grading around the root balls. Uh, and so we're removing them and replacing them. Uh, so stepping back even further, why do you need that many spaces in the parking lot and why is that area crucial? Uh, because regardless of the parking spaces themselves, the trees would be impacted because of the dry aisle that supports not only the turning movement for the parking lot, but also for any access to the, to the site. So it wouldn't just be those parking spaces that you would lose, you would lose a double loaded corridor, which would significantly impact their ability to use the site for business. So you're stating that you need that outside curved I'm looking right. at so if you were this. To look, right. So if you were to look at the site plan, which I see you have. So the trees that are right here are impacted not only, not really because of this parking space here, but really because of this area right here, this access area. Mm -hmm. And if this was eliminated, then the applicant would lose their ability to use the parking in general, because they couldn't circulate. <coughs> but I think in terms of landscaping, if, if more is desired, I think that is fine. I think that can be added if it's about the height of the trees. I think a, you know, the simple adjustment of the plant size, we can specify that they go in at, instead of eight to 10 footers, that they go in 12 to 14 foot, which nearly matches the size that they're in currently and is a much better tree than an arborvitae. Okay. All right, thank you. Sure. But if I might, just to answer your uh, question, if I may, along the front of Route 1 corridor, the reason that a berm won't work is that the Route 1 corridor is actually higher than the site itself. Yeah, I, I use that uh, as an example that w what we've yeah. required in the past is or offered as options on screening um, to soften the the impact of the building, right. uh, the so, visual on the road, especially because you're having uh, cars parking in front of it. Right, so one of the things that we're doing is we've actually increased that buffer. So as you know, the parking spaces are about 10 feet closer than they currently are. Mm -hmm. One of the things that this plan does is it moves those parking spaces 10 foot back, increasing the vegetative buffer, so it creates some more green space. Um, but the, the daylilies that are there are pretty substantial. Uh, if you wanted additional or, yeah, ornamental grasses, we could put those in. But from the, from the Route 1 corridor, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, you're not really seeing that plant material from the Route 1 corridor. So anything that we plant is going to be down the slope of it. So if we want to do ornamental grasses, one of the drawbacks is that it is a car dealership, and their intention is to draw the public in to buy cars while driving by. And I don't know what they'd be... Uh, thrilled with the idea of blocking all those cars from view. So we have tried to add additional ornamental trees. I think there's a handful along the front. Um, we've tried to flank the corners with ornamental grasses and supplemental plantings. Um, but if there's something specific that you think would be more desirable, um, I'd certainly be supportive of adding it to the plan. I, I think from the visual there, the front again is very stark. Yeah. The, the problem with computers is they're still computers, <laughs> and they're still only um, able to produce uh, pretty paltry plants that don't have any flowers on them. They don't show the robustness of it. Um, I could put bigger plants in there to try and create a visual trick, but you know the one that they have on the file for daylilies is that lovely little grassy mound. Um, but I think that if, if you've looked at the pictures in the packet, uh, unfortunately, again, they're just establishing, you know, it is spring. Um, it is pretty thick in there. So if there's something I can add, I'm happy to do it. 
right. uh, I'm betting my colleague to my left might have some suggestions. <laughs> uh, the, um, talk to me about the materials that you're using, especially on the front, that white material. What is that? I believe that's that vertical aluminum storefront, right? I, I, can, I can speak a little bit. Oh, Paul from Region Associates for the architect on the project. Um, all these areas which were shown in the more white um, on the rendering and the elevations is a, uh, an opaque glass, a frosted glass. Oh, speak, speak into You're not speaking into I'm sorry. These, uh, these areas that are shown mostly in white are the lighter gray on the elevations and white on the rendering are um, an, an opaque frosted glass. Um, that's all glass along the whole front as well as around the side here. You pick that up and put it on the, thank you. This one is, yeah. <coughs> so that's glass I'm looking at? From this point all the way out around the front is all glass. Okay. It's three different colors. This is all a white frosted. This is a, a blue glass, and I can show you some samples as well. And then we have these areas of the very clear glass that show the uh, show views into the showroom onto, onto display cars. <clears throat> and the rest of the material? And then the rest of the building around the sides and the back would be a, uh, a metallic uh, gray silver color. Do you have example? Do you have yes. samples with you? Yes. Thank you. So this is the this is the um, the, the frosted glass. That's the majority of the front of the building. Does this have any glare to it? Um, I wouldn't. It, it shouldn't. Not with the frosted effect that's on it. Okay. This is the uh, the blue. It's a uh, specific color picked out by Volvo. It's a similar tone. Same material. Mm -hmm. Same material. Yes. That's very neat. And that's the metallic. And this is the the remainder of the building that's as well as the roof. I have no more questions. Sounds going to glare off that, though, isn't it? Um, it could a little bit. A little bit. I find that hard to believe. I think it's going to glare off that a lot. When the sun hits that, yeah. and that's going to be all along the sides and the roof. We are not happy. Okay. My notes are not what you would call in order, so I may repeat myself a little bit. I still don't know why we have to remove the large trees. I apologize. Let me, let, let's go way back. What was the rationale for making the new building as far south as you could get it? as opposed to reversing that decision and making it as far north as you could get it. I mean, I know that there's a wetland in there, but you know, you're gonna to have to deal with the wetland anyway. There's a wetland in there that's also now a stream, which is why we're maintaining our setback off But of you're it. protecting yourself from it anyway. Right, but the setback, so if you were to go to sheet 13, well, we can go back, but let's go to sheet on nine of 19. So you can look at the setbacks that apply to, to the portion of the land. The building simply wouldn't fit. A 
Okay, what we're trying to do here is put a very large pig into a very small pot. And it's not working. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you can do about it, but if, you, if, if, the, if the best you can do is to replace those large trees with other large trees, mm -hmm. then that would be my request. Let's not That's, put, let's not yeah. put, it, and no white pine. What is everyone's problem with white pine? Sorry, it's not I can great. tell it's you exactly. I can tell you exactly what the <laughs> problem is with white. I just spent two thousand dollars because I planted white pine when I moved into my house, and white pine grows very tall, very fast, and as it grows up, everything on the bottom comes out. So you have no buffer at all. So the thing with white pine is they, they do grow very tall, they grow very, very quick, fast. very fast, which is what makes no them. Well, that's what makes them a great buffer. So when you planted them, how many years ago did you plant them? 40. Right. So in 40 years, those trees will be quite tall. Probably, quite. Ready, probably, probably ready to come Honey, down. Honey, don't so try to explain the white pine to me. I'm sorry. I had to cut them down because they were providing no further buffering. With all due respect, I understand you don't like them. But I think if you'll let me explain why we're using them in the place that we are, mm -hmm. would you afford me that? Sure. Okay. So what we're planting is the white pines first, closest to the property line, and then they're underplanted with another species of fir. So the logic being that as they grow tall and they need to be removed, the fir will be established and they can be a good solid And that's buffer. going to be written into the contract. You can absolutely write it. It's no, it's no different than what we did with Martin's Point. Those are existing white pine. They're large. Everyone wanted to keep them. We underplanted them with hemlock. Okay, I think I've made my opinion known. Um, it seems as if we have, uh, where did we end up in terms of needing all of those lights along that um, southern border? So much has happened since we started this discussion. Um, so the, I mean, do we, do we still really need all of those lights? Yes, because currently what he has is a very, very large pole, maybe two of them in the parking lot, casting light long distances <coughs> across the entire parking lot. The LEDs are shorter. They have a shorter cast. Are they going to be on a cutoff? They are going to be on a cutoff. So about what time at night will they go off? I don't have a number, but we can, we can supply that for... Okay, we'd like to know. Now, they're not going to be completely cut off. They're just dimmed. Because the discussion that we had with Rich was that we need them on for safety and security. And just so for, for clarity, when you said they're not going to be completely cut off, but I think you meant shut off. They are shut cut off, off thank you. light fixtures. Yes. That's, that are, I thank just you. want to be clear on language here. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's go good. Ahead. Thank you. I really have a great deal of empathy for the people who are uh, abutters because I don't think. Let me ask you. This is this is. If there's one thing I've learned from my many years of sitting here is that the way to create a situation where there is not a problem is to meet a potential problem head on. It would have been really nice if you'd met with the neighbors and explained to them in advance what it was you were thinking about doing and asking them if they had any advice on how it might be easier for them as well as easy for you. There's not enough of this that goes on. This is a, resi this is a residential neighborhood that is up against an automobile dealership. Hello. We had to know there was going to be an impact, right? If you didn't know there was going to be an impact, what toadstool was everybody under? It only makes sense to me that you ask for input from these people. So now here we are, and what can we do to help them? Well, the first thing we do is we do everything we can possibly do to keep the lights down. It seems as if perhaps what you explained in terms of how those uh, cars will be coming into the dealership for, would you pick up the uh, one that's on the ground there? So that the noise of all of that they're now dealing with will be will be less intense. Is that what I'm getting? Yes. You understand what she's saying? Don't just point and say yes, or point and say no, because otherwise you got to stand up. Only because when she's 
which is pointing out she's standing in front of it, so I can't see the map. Here. <laughs> so we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at it from Route 1. The cars are going to come in from the side. No, so if you're coming in from Route 1. Mm -hmm. They're going to come through those doors. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can do this multitasking. But you know, right. we, we have a... We have a, a Good help, there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what we're going to do, the cars come in here, mm -hmm. and they park inside for service. No different than if you go to another dealership. You just don't get that currently at this Volvo. The cars wait here. They're brought into the service bay. They're serviced, and then they exit through one of these. So any activity that is involved repair of the car is going to be done inside. Inside the building. So the noise that is now being experienced from the outside will no longer be there. Well, I can't speak to, what was it, the dent? The tire changing. Well, the tire changing, they're not going to, I don't think they're doing that out on the site currently. They're just doing it in bays that face you. So bays, that, you, understand, you understand my question, which right. is what's going to be left outside that's going to make a great deal of noise to a buddy neighbor's? Right, and I'm trying to clarify. I can't speak to them trying to fix dents that come off of the car delivery rack. So he described, remember the cafe? Yes. I can't speak to that because I don't know the answer to it. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you very much, sir. Really appreciate it. The whole idea of windows, I'm not sure that I buy that this item that was passed down as being, you know, opaque, if you will, really is what we had in mind. Um, it's not a window. It's a facade, and we, we think of windows as being an architectural form. So I personally, as one member of this board, don't think that that is what we were looking for. Um, there are a couple of things that are requested for us to take a specific look at by staff. <coughs> One is the fact that um, the site entrances will be separated by at least 130 feet. That's what our ordinance says. But it appears that the two northerly entrances are in what you're representing is 115 feet. Have we discussed that with staff? We have. Those are the existing entrances. So to change that would be to move one of the existing. And I think what really benefits is that I think as uh, the neighbor has described that sometimes the car carriers come in, the, I guess the southernmost entrance, and they deliver the cars in the parking lot closest to the buffer. And I think one of the things yeah. that this third exit or egress being removed does is it eliminates that delivery in that location. Okay, so as a member of the board, we've asked the question. I'm not sure that staff is happy with the answer, but I want staff to be happy. So, <laughs> you know, if this isn't going to take care of it, then you and staff have to talk because... Yeah, I thought staff was happy. Are they not? I don't know if we were happy or sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So well, I think just as a reminder for the board, typically, so the site review ordinance says um, where you have... A, really tries to reduce the number of curb cuts right. along a road um, and tries to limit it to one. Um, but we're not doing that. The applicant has, they, they've made a, they've made, you know, so they've I'm moved, moved in that direction by removing one of their existing three. They are still looking to maintain two. So the question to the board is, I guess staff would say to the board, are you happy? Because ultimately you're well, the one. I don't know the whether I am or if I'm not. I, mean, I wouldn't have asked the question if it didn't come right. up from and, board and, comments. And we so the, the standard sort of talks comments. about ensuring that, you know, where um, uh, the language is in staff comments, it talks about um, uh, the standard state that there shall be no more than one full service street or drive from any lot to any street except when the additional entrance exit must be provided to print to prevent traffic hazards or congestions. Um, and so I guess that's really so the what question. We, Has the board seen No, the, the question is, is they should be separated by at least 130 feet. This is 115 mm -hmm. feet, and it should be discussed with the board. Mm -hmm. So what am I supposed to be discussing, whether that's safe or whether there's a way we can change it? Or I mean, those are existing entrances now, am I correct? <coughs> My personal opinion as a member of this board is I don't think it's important enough to change the entrances. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, 
I'm a little concerned about the parking area question. The snow storage area is located within the parking field, meaning eight parking spaces will be eliminated during the winter months. And as I remember, it's on the northern side, mm -hmm. which is where it might be abutting the wetlands, et cetera. I think that's since been changed. I think that's one of those easy ones that can be submitted after the fact. But okay. um, we have provided an additional snow storage that's okay. not in the parking field. Great. Um, a waiver from the standard of what? Um, internal walkways will be provided. Oh, I know what I was going to be doing here. Um, the um, internal vehicular circulation. The applicant has provided an auto turn simulation saying that emergency vehicles can maneuver. So what is the waiver request that we're looking for? Waivers for the driving aisle with standards? Right, we're reducing them down to 21 in the front and on one portion of the side. So if they passed, and it looks like it was, they did pass the um, auto turn simulation for staff's input, is there really an issue in terms of their request for a waiver, safety-wise? But the auto turn shows that it's Possible. I don't think there is a concern from the fire department. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Um, the sidewalk I don't have any problems with. Additional plantings along the westerly edge of the pavement on the site to ensure adequate buffering from the R2. We've discussed that ad nauseum. I think that when you come back, you want to really be, you know, get, get an artist, get, get some colored pencils, mm -hmm. do something. Would it be, um, I, I think the goal for the applicant was to, to receive some sort of um, vote, but it, it doesn't look like you're ready to do that. But if it would certainly please the board mm -hmm. um, towards moving towards the vote, I'm happy to swap out the white pine with whatever would please the board in whatever size. And what is it you were going to be putting in front of the white pine? Furs. Okay. Show me how that would look. What kind of fur is it going to be? Because, I mean, I really do have a big concern right. about that. I'm happy to replace them right now and make them all fur and hemlock. As long as they're tall enough. As to put them they in. can be 12 to 14. Perfect. Hemlock would be lovely. Okay. Uh, and could we, is it a potential for the board to receive a vote this evening with any outstanding items being a condition of approval, that being the DEP. I would be willing to make that a condition of approval. I would appreciate that. I don't think we've done anything else, have we, that we would, would create a condition of approval? I'm, for what I've said, that, that would be fine with me, to make it a condition of approval. Um, the overhead doors, they're going to be the same color as the glass that you showed, right? I believe so. Uh, yes, I, they're, they're not going to be the blue. Those will be no. clear glass. They'll clear. be clear glass. So you can see who's coming in? <laughs> okay. So the main entrance doors... Sure. The main entrance doors here, the service reception, would be clear glass. Um, the ponds on either side of the service department were also shown as clear glass. What is on the left-hand side of the Volvo blue? What's on that 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 this? that mm, that piece of the this right here that, that goes to the left? What is that building for? This right here. That whole section. This is a small. No. Oh, I'm take sorry. take where it says Volvo in blue. Yep. And now go to the left. That whole building right there. This what right is here? that? This is the main showroom portion of the building. Is there a way that we can get more glass in that? See, we're looking more for, clear glass. You mean? Yeah, we're looking for something that makes this a little more appealing, a little less, a little less like a box mm -hmm. with nothing to break it up. We have <clears throat> we have these two areas of the clear glass, but we could make those larger. That'd be good. Make that a, as far as I'm concerned, I would like to see that to be a condition of approval as well. 
because we really would like to see this look a little less. I mean, it's so hard. I mean, I've been doing this forever, and it's so hard to look at these and know what you're getting. And you can give me photographs, and I still don't know what I'm getting. So the closer you can come to giving me a really good, that's what you mean, idea, I would be grateful, really grateful. Because this is right on Route 1, OK? And it's a boring building. So anything you could do to make it less boring would be really helpful. Um, let's see. I guess that that uh, prepared to discuss the materials proposed. You've done that. Um, landscaping instead of the driving grass. I just, it's a landscape lady. I'm sorry. I love you for it. Uh, no, you don't. But you put up, <laughs> but you put up with me. Lilies are lilies. They only bloom for a short period of oh, time. Oh, these are Stella's. But they... they're stunning for those six weeks. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it, this is not landscaping make. It's a, it's a thing that you put in there to say, oh, look, it's bright yellow. What can we add? Hmm? What can we add? Something perennial that is going to bloom for longer than that. And there's all kinds of stuff. So we're probably, shrubs. We're probably not going to be able to get the shrubs in there. Because mainly because they're at the even if I put them in, you're not you're not going to see them from the bottom of the hill. Okay, right. I give up. No, grasses, don't, don't ornamental up. grasses are cool. Ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses are cool. That. Something that is, I, I've been I've been having this argument forever with people who want to put in auto dealerships on Route One in terms of what does landscaping mean. I haven't won yet. I guess I'm not going <laughs> to win again. Well, let's see if we can if we can break a middle ground. Do you, do you want something at the front that? Do we have Do we have a landscape architect here? That's I yours? am a landscape you architect. You are the landscape architect, and you tell me. You say this every time. You can't think of something that you can put there that is. I could put all over. sorts of things there, but I don't think that they're going to be any taller than daylilies. It's not that the daylilies only bloom for a short period of time, and then they just die off. How about this? How about we cut the front half of the daylilies out? And we'll put in catmint, okay. or we'll put in red roses. Sound okay. good? That's, there you go. You're, you're starting to think like what I'm looking for. Okay. I think that a little more creativity is what I'm looking for. I don't have any. Yeah, specific... I think we're just trying to save the plant material that exists. I but... understand. And, and the thing is that you're not adding a whole lot along Route One, mm -hmm. so you know, let's build it up. So, are we okay with the condition of approval if I cut the front half of daylilies out and add a mix of yep, red I'm roses? Yep, I'm fine with that. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much for listening and being patient with me. Can I speak for 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. Sure, go oh, on. Oh, you're so nice. I am. Go on. 30 seconds. <laughs> 29. <laughs> 28. The two issues that just came up. One is the glass on the surface. And I was sitting here looking, having lived next to this for I don't know how many decades, knowing where the sun comes up, knowing where the sun flows around that, I do not think that the sun will reflect off that building okay. at any point during the day. Two, ground. That's 30 mm -hmm. seconds. The landscapers, ground the, the landscapers who work Portland Volvo are doing an incredible job. I get very pleased every time I go by and see what they're doing. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All set? Mm-hmm. Um, first, I think the building looks very nice. I like, I like the way it looks, so I have no problem with that. And I frankly have no problem with the, uh, the doors either, okay, the doors facing the way that they're recessed in the building and everything. Um, I'm wondering why, why do you need, uh, just a question, why do you need the two entrances? I know they're there, but what, why do you need them? Um. Oh, the two driveway entrances. Um, well, I guess to answer it in a, um, the easiest fashion would be, um, they're currently using the three, but this is primarily, uh, if you were a, a, somebody like you or I visiting the dealership, um, and I've, I've actually tried this myself, we, we normally pass this one, right? And right now it's because there's two sides of this dealership, you can't really, come in here and cross in front of the dealership. Um, but if you were you or I, we're probably coming in this side of the driveway heading towards the building to park. 
But if you're the car delivery, uh, you're going to come in this way because this is your straightaway to make the delivery and then pull out um, of the dealership. Um, so if, we, if you were to insist that one additional driveway were removed, uh, we would have to get rid of this one driveway, which makes it kind of a non-direct route into the dealership for a visitor, for a, a customer to come down past or to miss the entrance and then to come in and navigate around. So the, the reason I ask that is the other car dealerships on Route 1 have just one entrance. Sure. You know, and um, so I, other than the fact that it's there, I was wondering mm -hmm. what the rationale was for keeping it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now, so uh, when the car carrier comes now, it comes in that, with that, to that southbound, the southernmost entrance, and that's where it goes in, Correct. and it unloads the cars right in that area? Not currently. Currently it comes in... Oh, right, yes. Currently it comes in at the southernmost. We're eliminating that. No, it doesn't. But it drops off in the buffer. It goes in here, in the existing building, and goes around, and then dumps cars here, and then goes out that... I'm sorry, I had it reversed. Okay. Um, um, I, I think the problem we have here, and... and they're not insurmountable problems, okay? It reminds me a little bit of the conversations that took place with the uh, most recent discussion with Mercedes mm -hmm. and the abutters, okay? And I recall some of that discussions were uh, pertaining to work being done outside the building. Um, also, um, loudspeakers. You didn't mention any loudspeakers, but uh, I imagine they might have loudspeakers as they're looking for mechanics at the, or, or salespeople out on the, on the force out on the um, grounds. Um, I think anything that can be done, and these are basically operational things that would make it more pleasant for the abutters, is to reduce any of this outside noise, and, and the lighting seems to be taking care of itself with the new lights. Um, so, for instance, um, the I know um, with the Mercedes dealership, when they used to bring the, the cars in, they used to bring in, I believe, in the back, and they would leave the car, the, the truck running. You know, um, and I'm not sure if they still do that. I don't recall how that was resolved. Maybe Sue does, I'm not sure. But um, I think if anything could be done from an operational point of view to uh, reduce those concerns okay. that the abutters have would be helpful, you know. Um, then I, I hate to go back on these trees, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do have a concern about um, you, you removing you know, not putting in the white pines, but just putting in the hemlock. Is that what you said? Hemlock and fir. All right. Because the, the oh. trees that are there now, as I recall seeing them, the ones closest to the abutters are very tall right now. And then the ones closest to the parking tend to be maybe, what, 20, 30 feet high or something like that. Um, if you're, if you take, those are the ones you're going to take out, the, right. the shorter ones. Right. Yeah, I think um, as the neighbors described, um, they were describing them about 15 foot tall, and that's probably probably accurate, if not yeah. a little bit more. But what we're proposing uh, to do was to change that size from 8 to 10 to 12 to 14. Oh, okay. So we would be putting in 12 to 14 foot tall hemlock and fir. And, and then I would say, in, you know, instead of maybe spacing them out, maybe as you haven't designed, um, making sure that they create more of a condensed, you know, buffer where these two homes are. Mm -hmm. I, I know he's going to be upset because he's going to lose his lighting. <laughs> so. Right. He's not going to be able to read it tonight. Oh, on the, on the way you have the lilies, I think that looks nice as well. Okay, but but I was looking, I was wondering if you know instead of um, I think something that could in, uh, create some interest when there's no buds on the on the flowers, no blooms, you know, and uh, I was thinking of a small broom or something like that with maybe a low. Line, you know, like a low juniper shrub or something like that. I don't, 
I don't know how the other board members feel about that, but I don't want to bring that all up again. Um, the, the last, I think that's all I have. Um, is there anything else I should be, besides what you just told me? Is there anything else? Roger, I have one more thing. Yeah, uh, I, I know you had said It's okay. I, I know you said that uh, there was some additional snow storage, and I just looked through these plans and I couldn't find it. The only thing I saw was uh, the elimination of those eight spots in what I think is the employee area. Right. So we received the comments on Thursday, <coughs> and so we have we have that now addressed. But there is no submission. Uh, well, if, if you could perhaps point sure. out where <coughs> you're thinking of putting that. Yep. Yeah, let me just grab it. I don't even know if I have it in my packet. Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Then the other hang-up is going to be the um, main DEP permit or the approval. So what we can do is, due to the amount of conditions of, of the approval and lack of the uh, main DEP permit, we can consider an, uh, this application as a consent item for, fut for a future meeting if, um, if it's a pleasure of the board. Fine, Ms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? That's fine. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. All right. Do we need to vote on this? What's that? Do we need to vote on this? Uh, not if you're going to move it to a consent. Basically, what we'll do is the applicant will submit revised materials based on this conversation and staff comments, and then um, once we review that and think everything's been satisfied, we'll bring that back to the board. And assuming the board thinks the same, it'll be a quick action uh, at that meeting. Okay. Sounds, Sounds wonderful. Okay, good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Why don't we take a five minute break right now?
everybody aware of that. So the uh, next item on the agenda is m &R Holding, LLC, request a subdivision plan review for Crossroads Plan Development District Phase 1, Assessors Map R52, Lot 4. Thanks. Uh, so just as a reminder, this de proposed development, Scarborough Downs, and the Crossroad Plan Development Zoning District. Uh, in April, the board granted master plan approval for Phase 1 of the development, the Scarborough Downs site. Uh, phase one is approximately 57 acres and is the southernmost portion of the entire Scarborough Downs uh, property abutting Route 1. The applicant is in front of the board with a preliminary subdivision plan for the entire phase one site that includes 30 single family homes, three development lots, and associated open space. Just to give an overview of the review process for this project, the board will first review the overall subdivision plan. Uh, following final subdivision approval, just to remind us, preliminary subdivision. Uh, the applicant will then provide individual site plan applications for the multifamily lots within phase one. A wetlands and vernal pool peer review was completed on the site during the spring. That did result in a few additional wetlands identified <coughs> on the site. These wetlands have been incorporated into the updated <coughs> subdivision plan before the board. Uh, the applicant has indicated that the Phase 1 development is not anticipated to have a significant impact on the operation of the Route 1 and Payne Road intersections with the Scarborough Downs Road. Given the size of the entire Scarborough Downs development and the impacts it will have on the Route 1 and Payne Road corridors, the applicant should discuss with the board when they anticipate making improvements to these intersections. <coughs> Staff has had discussions with the applicant regarding the maintenance and ownership of some of the unique amenities uh, located within the public right-of-way of Scarborough Downs Road. Uh, the applicant and staff are working on an MOU to help facilitate this process. And the applicant should discuss the timing and construction phasing for the Scarborough Downs Road and what is envisioned for the transition area of the roadway. As part of the master plan discussion, the applicant and the board discuss a linkage from the site to the trail system abutting the property on the state-owned land. The design of this connection should be carefully considered as it could be a desirable pedestrian link to the municipal campus and the amenities in the Oak Hill neighborhood. During the master plan phase, the board requested additional information related to the architectural details of the single family homes to ensure the structures would meet the intents of the standards. The applicant should provide the board with the minimum required requirements which will be applied to the subdivision to ensure the design of the single family homes will be maintained by future owners. Just a few more. <laughs> Staff memo, it's a big project, so a lot to say. We began the conversation about the growth management ordinance. The applicant and the board should begin to discuss the future report approach towards the growth permits this evening. And finally, the staff should give the board an update on the status of their main DEP permit application. And I believe that's all from staff at this moment. Is it 10.30 yet? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Good, evening. Good evening. Rocky Rister representing m and Holdings. Um, I'm not going to take too much time. I uh, have Dan uh, Bacon here with me tonight. He's going to give you a presentation, try to answer uh, a handful of these questions. We've got Randy Dutton here uh, that can answer traffic questions and uh, Lucas Anthony to, to answer any uh, engineering questions that the board might have. I, I just want to point out tonight that, that we're really focused on pod one subdivision. And we're going to come back to you folks with uh, different site plans for the various lots, for the multifamily uh, aspects of the project. But we're not here to talk about that tonight. We're strictly here to talk about the subdivision of, of Pod 1, uh, the 30 house lots, and the breaking off of the uh, future multifamily lots. Um, one of the things that I did want to point out to the board tonight, we're, we're a little behind our schedule. And I know our schedule never lines up with, with the way it really happens. but. We do need to get something started with Scarborough Downs as soon as we can. And uh, we got bumped at the last meeting. We understood the board was pretty busy and uh, we weren't, weren't going to get heard. So we're here tonight. I know there are other folks that are probably not going to get here tonight, and I know how that feels. I'm sorry about that, but we do need some time tonight, and we do have some things to, to talk about. But I think in the end, I think the board could, could give us a preliminary approval on our subdivision, and that's what we're hoping for. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, Dan, good presentation. Uh, thank you. Dan Bacon from Coral Palmer. Um, Rocky introduced the rest of the team, so I'll jump right into the presentation. And as Mr. Torres introduced, um, we've worked through a variety of stages so far in the Crossroads District. 
and we are now at the preliminary subdivision review stage and uh, really to kind of set up the development of this first phase of the project. So we have two plans here that are actually the, the same area. Um, this is an illustrative plan as to what pod one or phase one would look like built out. And this is the preliminary subdivision plan that's before you. Um, we're showing you this one not to have you kind of get into the details as to the, um, the layouts of those three lots that uh, Rocky introduced, but really to show you the context of the project. Um, we didn't think it was fair to just show the preliminary subdivision without showing how the Downs Road connects with the site plans that you'll be looking at at a future meetings uh, here, here, and here, as well as the single family neighborhood and how the trails and the open space all uh, interconnect, which we talked a lot about at past <coughs> meetings uh, during the master planning process. So what is before you this evening is the preliminary subdivision plan over here. Um, and to kind of translate the two, uh, this is the proposed Scarborough Downs Road coming up from Route 1, which is off this, this plan, uh, which will come up and it'll go past um, or to the end of this first phase of the project. It'll provide access to lots 2 and 3, which are shown on the subdivision plan there. Uh, again, we'll be back to you for site plan review to get into the details around building architecture, landscaping, layout, um, sidewalks, parking, etc. for lots two and three. Um, but lot two will it'll be a mix of eight units, eight unit buildings and duplexes like we've presented in the past. And then lot three will ultimately have a memory care facility that we've talked about in the past. Um, lot one is up right at the entrance to the 30 lot uh, single family neighborhood that we're going to speak about in more detail this evening. And this lot one would um, have a collection of uh, apartment buildings, um, four 12 unit apartment buildings. Um, and so, in terms of, again, this evening's review, um, we're <coughs> seeking approval to, to simply create these three lots and come back to you for site plan review for the details of them. Uh, to lay out and create the Downs Road. Right now, the Downs Road, or driveway, is, is just a driveway. It looks like a road, it acts like a, ro like a road, um, but it's not separate from the overall parcel. It's not built to town standards. So a key component in this whole process is laying out a formal right-of-way for the Downs Road to provide, provide access to these three lots as well as the single-family neighborhood and um, have it incorporate all the elements that, that we desire, that the zoning is asking for in terms of providing access to this first phase, but also providing access to future development um, within the Downs. <coughs> and so this is a cross-section. Cross the, the top plan or cross-section shows the general layout of of what the Downs Road is going to look like, particularly along the development, along these three lots. Um, but coming in off of Route 1, the, the proposed Downs Road would, would be a boulevard. So it would be separated um, one lane in each direction by a 14 to 16 foot wide boulevard that would be planted. We're, we're pretty excited about it from a kind of a gateway feature standpoint coming into this neighborhood, but also coming into the project as a whole. Um, so after you turn in off of Route 1 and the signals in that intersection, there would be a boulevard that would come up, and it would come up um, just short of this first pot of development, the, these first few lots. Um, and this cross section or road section would have, again, that boulevard, it would have 11 foot travel lanes um, in both directions, and it would have five foot bike lanes. Um, so we're designing this to be a very bikeable neighborhood um, right now. There might not be a lot of bikers coming in off of Route 1 and um, into Phase 1, but we think as this phase occurs and more activity occurs within the project, um, we think it's going to be a very bikeable community. So we want to provide that those facilities right out the get-go so that this road section can 
can handle the traffic, but also the bike traffic that we expect down the road. Um, we're also designing this section of, of the Downs Road to have a generous esplanade and then a six foot sidewalk that connects down um, into the sidewalk that's uh, in front of the Comfort Inn along Route 1 and ultimately hopefully connects to the sidewalk system in Oak Hill. Once we get up the Downs Road to um, where this, the first few lots are and the, the first development that would occur around the Downs Road, the, um, the road section changes. There wouldn't be that center boulevard any longer, but instead um, there would be the bike lane would continue. There would be on-street parking <coughs> that would serve um, the, the four condo units, or condo buildings, rather, that are proposed along the Downs Road. Um, that's kind of why it's important for us to show you the site plans. They're not before you because the, the road design needs to relate to these site plans. Um, so we would, we would have some on-street parking uh, along the Downs Road here and some curb cuts that tie, tie into those first few lots. We have been working with Public Works and staff around <coughs> snow removal because on-street parking isn't, um, isn't common in Scarborough and, and Scarborough's not set up for kind of easy maintenance of snow removal. So through an MOU with the town around um, this kind of different road cross section, we've been talking about um, the applicant and the HOA taking care of snow removal in the on-street parking spaces um, in front of these units, coupled with some other, other things, such as uh, maintaining the stormwater facilities that are proposed along the Downs Road, which are, um, I'll talk about those in a minute, but those are different than the typical uh, stormwater uh, approach the town, town sees on many streets. So once you get past these um, two lots and this pot of development, we continue on and, and similarly have some on-street parking for, um, for these apartments, um, just short of the proposed residential street. And then the, the road improvements will continue up a ways and then they actually transition back into the existing Downs uh, driveway. Really from um, not too far after you enter the site up to past where the proposed development is, is, uh, is occurring, the Downs Road actually shifts off alignment a little bit from the existing driveway surface of um, the existing uh, paved surface. And it actually shifts towards Enterprise Business Park. Um, I think it's about 40 feet, but Lucas will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we do that uh, intentionally to, to rebuild the street, um, to provide more building envelopes for the development on the other side of the street, but while also keeping a, a pretty healthy buffer to the business park so that it's um, we're screened from them and they're screened from us, given it's residential uh, next to some businesses. I think a few other points on the Downs Road that are worth mentioning, um, and we've talked about this in the past, we're going to provide a connection over to Technology Way, Enterprise Business Park, and we'll build out that connection um, to the business park, providing a crosswalk to provide vehicular connection, but also pedestrian connection, ultimately. Um, and um, other than that, uh, I did mention stormwater for the Downs Road, and we're going to be using some bio, um, bio cell. Focal point is the technology. It's a low impact development approach to stormwater. It's more distributed than larger ponds. Um, Luke, if you have questions, um, Lucas will answer those, not me. Um, but one of the, I think the really nice things about them, a couple nice things, one is they can smit excuse me, fit in small locations, small areas, so that enabled us to keep more buffers along Enterprise than other stormwater approaches. Um, they also are landscaped, so we've been, we're looking at how to integrate the landscaping in these stormwater facilities with our overall landscaping plan. So it's coordinated and that they're, they're amenities, they're aesthetic amenities, not just um, stormwater facilities. Um, another item that staff's raised is lighting, and we're not ignoring it. Um, we're, we're working on it. We want to do it deliberately, though. We want to use the town's sort of lighting standard, but customize it to a degree for the project so that it can be fixtures that the town's comfortable with and, and can maintain. 
but also integrates with the project. Um, so we've been spending some extra time figuring that out, and we'll present uh, most likely at, at the next time we see you uh, a comprehensive lighting package that shows how the Downs Road lighting relates to um, and, and ha has a similar theme to the lighting proposed in the site, in the site plans, in the individual lots. Um, so we'll be coming back to you with that and, and feel like that's something we can accomplish certainly before any final approval. Um, other, than, other than that, on the Downs Road, um, I would say we have been thinking a lot about transit and, and having this road and the project be transit ready. Um, we, don't, we haven't identified a specific location for, uh, for a bus stop uh, yet, um, but that's something that we keep in the back of our mind and, and we're actually talking to all the three transit agencies in the area about trying to have this project be a, a transit hub at the, at the end of the road. And it wouldn't necessarily be with this phase, but with future phases. So we've been designing with, with transit in mind for, um, for this project. In terms of the The other aspect that's before you this evening is the, the layout of um, this residential street and the 30 lots uh, for single family homes. Um, in this location here, this is the more detail on the subdivision plan of, of that area. Um, the proposal is to you know, access the 30 lots off this loop road. The road will traverse and go by um, lot one, which we'll review with you in the future for the multifamily. We are showing some on-street parking um, within uh, this residential street to serve the multifamily uh, lot one. So that's the kind of the integration relationship between the preliminary subdivision and the site plan and we wanted to show you this plan. So there would be some on-street parking here right next to a pocket park that's part of that lot one design, which we'll be coming back to you with uh, again, a similar arrangement with public works around snow removal uh, here. Um, this residential street would um, be 22 feet wide. It would um, have concrete curb. We've planned sidewalks on both sides of the street to serve this neighborhood. We've incorporated esplanades in all the locations that we can. Um, there's some um, wetland crossings and wetland, and we're trying to minimize our wetland crossings. Um, so in those locations, the sidewalks don't have esplanades, they, they come into the curb so that we can minimize our footprint on the wetland impacts. Um, and that's been, been very deliberate. So in this location here, um, this location here, and this location here, those are the three locations that uh, we cross <coughs> wetlands at narrow, narrow points and have the, the, the narrow infrastructure. Um, again, on the lighting, we're, we'll come back to the board with the details on the lighting, but we expect to use the uh, residential fixtures that the town's recently selected through your LED street light uh, process. Um, this part of the neighborhood, like these other areas, um, are designed with neighborhood commons neighborhood gathering places. We presented that at some, some past meetings. And so there's um, two different, what we're, call we're calling gathering spaces within the, uh, within the inside of the loop road, behind some of the homes um, on uplands, um, but adjacent to some wetlands. Um, we're, we've designed some kind of natural playscapes into those areas. Our landscape architect has some really cool ideas for um, the layout of those, um, and they're designed thinking that, you know, this is probably going to be very attractive, kind of smaller, smaller size homes for families. Um, these are small lots, so they're going to be, you know, houses in the 14 to 2,000 square foot range, maybe 1,800 square foot range. Um, so starter houses or, you know, houses for, for young families and other, other aged families as well. 
but we've geared the open spaces around having some, some playscape areas um, versus these other areas, other parts of the project that are more maybe senior focused. Um, connecting all these gathering places are trails, and, and these trails connect lot one through, uh, through the open space, and we, we've been coordinating with staff on um, a connection over to the, to the state owned land to the east. It's own, I think it's managed by the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. We've, we've reached out to Scott Lindsay um, through that agency, and we're trying to set up a site walk with him and would um, hope the staff would join us to try to figure out okay, what's the right trail alignment to leave this project, um, traverse that state property, and connect to the trails that can tie into to Sawyer Road and to Memorial Park and where we are here on the campus. Um, in addition to, to those trail connections, we're also showing a trail connection down to this other area of the project. And we're leaving the option and the potential open to have a trail system that ultimately goes up to kind of the core of the downs where the grandstands is, where we envision um, the center of the project. But we need to figure that out because this is a pretty large wetland area. Um, so we need to work with DEP on the right alignment for that. Um, in addition to the, the trail system, um, what else am I missing? In terms of the, the lot sizes, uh, the lots are ranging really from 3,000 square feet at the smallest single family house lot, 3,200, up to close to 9,000 square feet in terms of lot size. Um, so not dissimilar to, say, Eastern Village or Dunstan Crossing. Um, small lots, compact lots. Uh, the building side yard setbacks are, are five feet as approved by the board through the master plan. We're maintaining 25-foot um, setbacks to the wetlands and keeping the lots um, outside of the wetland um, buffers um, so that there isn't encroachment that happens over the, the long term by homeowners. Um, and there was some staff questions or comments around the front yard setback um, because the zone allows a zero, a, zero, uh, a zero setback or a zero front yard setback. And we've kind of self-selected a 10-foot setback for just the single family lots um, based on coordination with the landscape architect on, on wanting the houses close to the street, but not right up on the sidewalk, um, providing a 10 to 15 foot kind of front yard, front porch. Um, all the houses are designed with a front porch or a front stoop um, that is at least six feet in depth. That's sort of a, uh, a minimum depth that's um, typical and, and comfortable. Um, so. <laughs> That's been sort of a, a deliberate self-imposed setback. Um, we can show a zero setback if that makes more sense from a space and bulk standpoint, but we're still likely going to be building at 10 or further, 10 or 15 feet back just for that relationship to the street and to allow street trees and, um, and to have the right uh, perspective to the street. Um, I think that's what I have for an overview of the Downs Road, uh, which is before you, um, the, the 30 lot subdivision, uh, single family subdivision, and then the three lots that will come back to you shortly for, for further review. I think the other items that we want to touch on, and um, I know Randy and Lucas are here if you have questions around traffic. Um, more detailed questions around traffic and stormwater engineering. Um, in terms of traffic, we've prepared a traffic assessment um, based on the, all of the development proposed, both in the subdivision that's before you tonight, but also those three lots. Um, the traffic generation is below a traffic movement permit, so below the 100 trips in the peak hour which would trigger a traffic movement permit by DOT. So the <clears throat> DOT wouldn't review this phase of the project. Um, we are looking closely at a master plan for traffic improvements and transportation improvements in general. Um, 
that would kick in at the next phase of the project or next stage of development <coughs> that's most likely to occur off of Payne Road. We're starting to, to look at some layout and concept plans for an entirely different kind of character of development up there that's more commercial, um, light industrial. Um, so it would be at that stage that there would need to be a traffic movement permit by DOT and also some likely uh, mitigation or off-site improvements, um, probably particularly at, in the Payne Road area. Um, but that's work that we're doing that will feed to continue to work with staff and, and feed to the board at that at that next phase. Um, but in terms of Route One and Payne Road, and again, Randy can speak to this uh, in more detail. Um, there aren't there's capacity for um, for this project, and so there aren't impacts that would um, drop the level of service to an unacceptable level. In terms of the actual Downs Road connection to Route 1, um, for this initial phase, because there, there's capacity um, and because of the expense of the infrastructure and really what's um, before Rocky and his team for this first phase, we're not proposing to make um, physical changes or capacity improvements or, or a new signal system at, at the Route 1 intersection, but we are laying out the boulevard, the way the Downs Road integrates with the intersection in a way that can easily phase in those improvements. Um, and that's something that we're, we have um, planned out and we want to meet with staff to review that in the next few weeks um, before any further board review of the project to get their uh, review and input and direction on it. So we've been figuring out the best way to kind of transition this first phase um, and the downs cross section at the right point so we can easily fill in the improvements at Route 1 when those, those improvements are needed. Um, in terms of other things, um, this phase like the entire zone requires a 10% affordable housing uh, requirement. So unlike any other zone in town, affordable housing is not a bonus or um, this thing you can opt to do. It's a requirement. And um, we've been working with Mr. Chase and his staff around uh, what that looks like on the home ownership side. The town has a good program for rental housing and how to meet the 80% affordable housing requirement. We intend to do that. Um, six or so of the required 10% of this phase, but we also want to provide some home ownership um, units at an affordable rate at that 80%. And so there's more work needed on our side, but also on the town side to figure out what the program is to, to ensure they're affordable and to offer them to qualifying households. And so there's some draft material kind of going back and forth around that. Um, but we intend to meet that requirement again before final approval with a mix of rental and home ownership units in, in the project. Um, another staff comment um, that we appreciate is growth permits. Um, and uh, we're eager to kind of work with staff around uh, allowing for uh, the reserve pool to be used for this development, this, there's a lot of, um, there's a good number of multifamily units, there's a good number of these duplexes that are geared for seniors, and um, this is a type of project that's envisioned in the growth management ordinance, we believe that would tap the reserve pool, like a lot of the multifamily projects that have been using it over the past couple of years. Um, so we don't have the details of that, but um, we wanna work with, with staff on getting that figured out before your final approval. But the board needs to authorize that, so we just raised that like staff did to um, start that conversation, and we'll come back to you with, with that proposal before final approval. Um, I think the other couple items we had are around homeowner association documents, um, and sort of staff asked about maintenance and ownership of the open space, of the stormwater facilities, of the trails. There's a lot of amenities in this project that we're really excited about, but they're also, uh, they're, not, they're not necessarily customary. So 
and Rocky and, and his uh, legal team have been figuring out with our assistants, how do these get portioned out? And, and what kind of aspects of this first phase are responsible for different things, like stormwater, like the trails, like these common amenities. So we have drafts of those. We submitted drafts of those to DEP, or are, will be submitting this week to DEP around stormwater maintenance, um, and, and can submit those to, to the board and staff for review. Um, and I think that's what we have. Anything further from you, Rocky, before I? Okay, okay I'll um, open this up for <laughs> public comment. Anybody wishes to speak? Okay. Um, okay, who would like to stand on the, oh, yeah, we're all set, right? Yeah, who would like to stand on the board? Rachel, would you like to go? Don't refuse it. Sure. <laughs> no, I, I'm, re I'm ready. Um, actually, I've, I've got one sort of tangential um, comment. Uh, and that is um, the question or just a comment around the on-site grist mill that I gather you haven't been able to find. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, it's not for a lack of trying. Um, and, and we've been actually coordinating through Rocky with um, with Craig, who is the chair of the historic uh, committee or member of the historic committee, um, around that. And one of our staff has been tramping around, um, walking up and down Millbrook looking for it um, as recently as a few weekends ago uh, and hasn't identified even a, a sign of it. Um, and her focus has actually been on the development side of the stream. So I think just recently we thought if it's anywhere, um, if it, it has any existence at this point, it's on the, I'll call it the east side or the non-development side, the Millbrook Road side of the site if it's anywhere. So um, we haven't identified it and it's not under kind of threat by anything we're proposing based on all the ground we've covered. Well, I was <clears throat> appreciate the information. I was just going to suggest that it might be a very good project for the Boy Scouts. Okay. That that might be something a troop might be interested in getting involved in and studying the history and trying to see if they can find it. And that would be uh, uh, getting a bunch of enthusiastic young folks tramping around in there, but they might find it. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I have a question on parking um, for the single family homes. Now, I know you had said there's on street parking uh, connected, kind of attached to that area, but basically connected with the uh, multifamily. Is there going to be any on street parking or any provisions for overflow parking for the single family home area? Uh, we expect that there's generally going to be, um, for typical use, there's going to be parking obviously in driveways and garages, um, but I think we do have a bit more parking than required by ordinance, um, closer to the multifamily lot, so I think there's the potential for you know, some overflow parking to be accommodated. Um, on the public street, which would be closest to the single family house and that would be furthest from the multifamily. Um, but we haven't talked about that in depth internally, but that, I mean, there's some potential there. Yeah, I think um, given the smallness of the lots, I'm assuming we're looking at two stall garages on those houses. Generally, yeah. uh, and that would give them two spaces in front. Um, that doesn't allow for uh, graduation parties, Fourth of July parties, things like that. So um, some consideration of a visitor parking uh, that could be also part of the, the multifamily, but also connected even more to the single family so that folks, folks would know in some sort of signage that indicates that it's, it's a visitor parking. I if I recall correctly, one of the earlier meetings, you had talked about some overflow parking um, 
I'm trying to figure out whether it's north or south, so I'm just going to say towards the top, towards the end of the, yeah, right in that area. Is that still under consideration? Yeah, we can look at it again. We, we determined that for the multifamily, we had enough parking, um, but we need to look at how much excess we have to address, you know, concern about single family visitor parking. So, um, all right, thank you. Yeah, good. Um, I think you partially answered my question because I did have one, uh, and that was um, uh, the connection to Route One and the the appearance is the Esplanade going to go all the way down, or but you've you've not decided what that is really we going have to look a, like immediately? Or? We have a design, a basically a temporary plan um, to transition from the way it is today to accommodate the boulevard. So basically the, you know, the two lanes, uh, one lane each direction, and then it would need to flare out because you'd have a, you'd have a boulevard or an island in between. Um, we have it designed in a way and want to review with the town engineer and public works that design as to how that can be extended all the way down to Route 1 um, once Route 1 is improved because it changes the geometry of how, how the, the lanes come into to Route 1 and approach Route 1. So um, we have that mapped out and we want to re technically review it with staff and we'd have that ready for your review before final. Okay. And looking at the pocket uh, the, the upland areas for the single, single family. Um, those are going to be play areas or sit and reflect <coughs> areas. Or could you talk about that a little more? Yeah, there's two, <coughs> two kind of programmed. I'll call it areas. Uh, one's here, and one's here, and both are going to have some kind of natural play features like boulders logs, um, potentially like a fire pit, uh, something like that, so that the neighborhood can <coughs> have a place to, to get together um, that's close to the house, but in a natural setting. Um, there's trails, like I said, there's trails that connect really all kind of corners of the neighborhood to these focal points. Um, and there's a boardwalk planned because there's a kind of a narrow wetland crossing <coughs> from this gathering place to the one to the east. So to minimize wetland impacts and to just kind of have a cool feature, uh, we're proposing a boardwalk to get, get across that. Um, and then there's also going to be some stormwater uh, amenities within those as well, kind of on the edges. Um, and then that trail system connects, hopefully, to that state property. To the, to what do you mean by stormwater amenities? So there's two different, next to the play areas, there's these depressions that are going to manage stormwater. Um, and they're, they're fairly small footprint, um, and they're not steep or deep, but they're, they're going to be to the, to the side of... Um, those gathering places. Are you going to have uh, additional benches along the trails? We have been um, looking at benches and adding benches through our process. There are uh, some in the, on lot one that we'll cover next time. <laughs> um, but there's also there's there's some benches here um, and at a few of the trail crossings. There's benches for logical place for people to stop um, and, and rest or um, take a break. Uh, where do you anticipate dogs being walked? Because I'm assuming with single family, you're going to have a fair number of <coughs> critters around. When you mentioned that overflow parking area, that's, that's an area that we had looked at for a uh, potential kind of dog exercise area. We haven't programmed it out yet. so. Um, that's, that's a good reminder to, to kind of come up with a, a formal area that's designed, um, but we haven't, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay. That would be more of a site plan uh, design that we could bring to you. Okay, thank you very much. Rick? So, right now we're just looking at those, that 30 house lots, right? 
um, well, and the road. And the road. But. And sort of creating the, the lots for the multifamily development. So on, you had a plan up there. There you go. So these lots here. So yep. creating 30 lots along the residential street, creating these two, these two, maybe these three larger lots, which will come back to you to review right. what's proposed on them, multifamily, a mix of mm -hmm. two family, multifamily. But we're just designating that area right as, there as lots for to those be de determined. Right. And we're showing you this because we size yeah, them, I appreciate size that. them yeah. so that you understand, okay, what can fit on that and <clears throat> yeah, why it's shaped that way. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's yeah. very helpful. And it's, I think I should also, just for benefit of, of those who may be watching, um, so the subdivision process does have the two sort of step review process. So tonight they're still before you for preliminary approval or review. Um, and should they get preliminary approval, it would come back for a final subdivision approval. Um, so just as sort of as a reminder of what our subdivision review process is. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Oh, I suppose I should put this down a little bit, huh? Um, so as far as the entrance onto Route 1 and the exit, um, you know, further down, Cabela's, Two Rod Road, I think it is, whatever. Well, the, the connection to Payne Road. The connection to, the, to Payne Road, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, for, for what we're looking at here for these 30 house lots and just laying out this area, I'd be okay with not necessarily seeing the plan for that. And I know you said you kind of have one, mm -hmm. but once you get into the multifamily units and stuff, um, I definitely would want to see how you're going to handle those, that entrance and that, you know, entrance slash exits. Uh, because right now, a lot of people just use that as a cut through road. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, the, it's adequate uh, for what it is. But once you get development in there, you'll have to, you, obviously, I'm sure you know you'll have to work on that. So. Um, the that's the biggest thing is those that it, the, how you're gonna for me anyway how you're gonna lay how you're gonna handle that. Um, the entrance on the Route One right now isn't really the, the way it's laid out isn't bad at all. I, I don't think it's but um, I'd like to see what you what your thoughts are on that. Are the paths that are your that you're laying out are they. Paved like bike paths? Is that what you were thinking? They're going to be no. like a stone dust surface, or a, they're not going to be paved. Okay. Um, they're going to be more kind of natural surface. Um, there, we are proposing, as you can see, we are proposing paved sidewalks within the project right. along the Downs Road, but the paths are aren't going to be paved. Okay. And there would be boardwalks where there's wetland crossings. Okay. Or raised, you know, wooden crossings. Um, and then the other thing you talked about, like that kind of giving a further on in the process, you're going to kind of give a better layout of that, that common area that you talked about, but are there any plans, uh, somewhere to, for, um, like a playground or anything like that? Is that kind of, kind of thinking about that at all or, um, or is it just like a common area with some picnic tables or something? Or? Yeah, our landscaping plan. I, I brought a bunch of plans, but not landscaping plans. <laughs> um, shows the program for these two areas uh, in the single family neighborhood. And they're intended to be play areas, but they're not like elementary school playgrounds. They're more kind of natural play areas. So there's going to be boulders and logs. There's going to be places to sit. So I think our thinking is kids are going to enjoy it, but it's, it's a different kind of play, more a natural-based play. Um, and that's been, been our approach in that design. So there isn't going to be sort of a formal like park-like playground, um, but, but a, different, a different style one. The other pocket parks or commons are more going to be geared towards the character of these neighborhoods. So this is going to be more of kind of a green space for the multifamily that will show you at 
uh, our next meeting. Um, and this is actually a little walking area around um, a wetland pocket that we're conserving. Um, and there's going to be some open space associated with the memory care. But each kind of area of the neighborhood is going to have a common space that's geared towards the likely that residents of, of that area. Okay. So there potentially could be some benches and picnic tables, maybe, something. Yeah, there'll be outdoor seating. There'll be places yeah. to, yeah. Um, we can, we'll detail that out more in the, in the site plans for you. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, the way you've got it laid out with the boulevard and everything, I think that looks nice. So I don't really have any questions at this point other than that, the preliminary. Okay. Susan? Uh, I'd just like to start by saying that what you included in, I'm going to call it the packet, the main return to us, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I could follow it beautifully. I don't know who came up with it, but it's a goal. You did that, you are great. <laughs> <laughs> all great. I haven't seen it quite like it. Want to, want to identify yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Let it be said that they're all taking the credit. But I really have seen a lot of this kind of stuff, and this was really outstanding. So thank you very much. It was very um, thorough and easy to follow. Now back to what you really want to know from me. Um, I don't want to make this any more complicated than it has to be. So if I'm not mistaken, things such as um, the 10% front yard, yes or no, affordable, that's all going to come back later. We don't have to do that tonight, correct? We're going to, yes, the affordable housing requirements, yeah, we have to meet it. So it's not, a, it's not no, optional. I mean, how um, we're going to have a pro work out is not what we need to be discussing tonight. This is basically what you're looking for from us is the, the general layout of this pod. Of this preliminary subdivision, preliminary and we have subdivision. a lot more to do through right. site plan. I just don't want to get us off onto something that we're going to be looking at later. So if I start to do that, let me know. Okay. Miss Douglas, if I could on the affordable housing bit, yep. I think just um, not to spend too much time on it because I think you did hit the nail on the head. You know, I don't know that we need to have all the answers tonight, but know that they and they've already indicated that they're going to provide oh, for yes. the affordable housing. But I did just want to provide the board an update that um, we've been having ongoing discussions with the Housing Alliance, or staff has, um, the developer um, probably will get engaged here soon enough. Um, but we have a pretty good program in place in terms of rental um, units for affordability, and actually the applicant has experience with that with their project on mm -hmm. uh, Muzzy Road. It's the home ownership, single family home ownership that the town is still working through its program with. And so in the coming months, the Housing Alliance is really going to be working with that. And um, we'll be reaching out to the developer, I'm sure, to sort of codify what that system's going to look like. So um, again, not to belabor the point, I think you're right uh, on. I just want to make sure that I don't get off into, you know, muck land here, because we'll, we'll, we'll get to all of that later. Also, the, uh, what is it, the number of units that you can get, the number of, um, Permits that you can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That'll all be discussed later as well. Important things, but not what we're looking at right here. Okay. So. I guess the only thing I would offer in that <laughs> regard, only thing I would offer is if planning board members are hearing anything in terms of looking at growth management ordinance and the potential to take advantage of the reserve pool um, based on the language in the existing ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any concerns board members have in that regard, it would be good to hear it now. Otherwise, staff plans on working with the applicant. And well, we'll, that, we'll get a chance to see absolutely. what's being presented and what the options are and so on. Yep. I mean, cause, because I really need to know more the, about the specifics Understood. than I do tonight, but I don't need to do it tonight. Correct. I just, Yay. like I'm saying, if, if there's something that, if there's a red flag that jumps out in your mind, it would be good to hear it now. If there, no. Otherwise, um, okay. yes, you'll have plenty of time to dive into the details still. Okay. I would like to agree that I'm a little concerned about parking for the single family complex here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to say that for all the times that I've been through um, Dunstan, not Dunstan, um, Eastern Village, I don't remember whether they park on the streets there or not. I don't think they do. 
contractors do. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> the contractors do. The contractors do, yeah. They have a real hard time getting through there during the week. But I'm just trying to think this. Somehow or another, it works, it's, it works out. I don't quite understand how it does. If you're going to have a party, what do you do? Knock on the door of the people next to you and say, can I have two friends park in your driveway? I think it's, it's a very interesting issue. I, I don't think it's going to hold up my mm -hmm. oh, feelings that this is something that needs to be passed on to you to continue. But it's an interesting question. At one point you said duplex for seniors. Did that really mean that these duplexes are meant to be for seniors? They're not, we're not proposing them to be limited to seniors, but are... They'd be, they might be marketed. Marketed. marketed our thing, we think the many buyers will likely be seniors. Okay. There's, they're proposed as single story. They're proposed as two bedroom. Um, okay. And now these duplexes have garages as well. Yes, they have and a they mix have on, of and one. And they have on-street parking. There's some <coughs> on-street parking. Um, and there's also the depth of the driveway. <coughs> Um, so the, the porches project out towards the street and the drive the garages are set back so they're being designed to have driveway capacity for for a vehicle in addition to okay. a garage not that that's what we're looking at tonight but I just I just am a, I'm concerned that there's no place to park with all of these houses in this lovely area but I'm not gonna hold it up um, sidewalks on the single family homes, am I seeing sidewalks? On both sides of the street. On both sides. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And then there are places where there aren't, and I'm assuming that that's because of the wetland. They're on both sides of the street, I think on the entire um, street. In okay. some places, they're just not they with an esplanade. They they, okay. So you might be looking at a place that there's not esplanades. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right thing. If we drop down closer to Route 1, where the duplexes are, the road that feeds those duplexes comes to an end, and then you have to turn around and come back out, correct? As opposed to what we're looking at first, up above, which is the apartments, there is a connector that goes through to the main feeder road. Okay, go, go down as if you're gonna, no, no, yeah. Go, yeah, go into the duplexes, pick yeah. them up. Come up, no, 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 come up, yeah, this no, is, that, that road ends. Yeah, I'm getting the into the site plan, but this is uh, parking for these units here and garages. No, that's not what I'm saying. Units. I'm just saying yeah. that the, in order to enter and exit those duplexes, there's no connector to what's going on up above. There's no connection to this street up here. Correct. Correct. There's a, there's a wetland and an yep. intermittent stream here mm -hmm. that we don't want to cross, but for, we're proposing a boardwalk. Okay. We'll have to talk about that when we get to the specifics. Um, I don't. Have, I think it's very exciting. I have no problems giving us preliminary approval with the idea that there will, there will be more questions when we get to the uh, finer details. But I think that the um, <clears throat> gathering spaces, quote unquote, is really an excellent idea. I, I just think this is going to be a huge success. And um, not to mention where it is. And I'm very excited about it. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think you've done a nice job, Dan, explaining everything. Uh, I don't have much to uh, add or ask. Um, just wanted to clarify one thing, though, was actually two things. One, um, at the meeting we had back in, I think, April or May, uh, you guys showed this video of what you anticipate the layout would look. And, and we're talking about the setbacks, the 0% versus 10%. Um, and the homes were kind of staggered along the street, so they weren't in a straight line. Are you still planning on doing that? or Because uh, I thought I heard you say you're going to be setting them back, setting back 16 feet or something like that. We talked about being more than 10. Um, we don't want to necessarily always be 15 or 16 because some of the lots aren't that deep yeah. and we've been trying to keep the wetland buffers on the rear of lots so um, these are small lots in general so there's kind of a there's a narrow margin as to where the house has to begin and end but we do um, in other locations on the site plans we think it makes sense for the buildings to be 
close to zero, like along the Downs Road where there's on-street parking or the sidewalks right there, um, and in the, the other three lots. On the single families, we do think we're going to be 10 or 15 <coughs> feet from the street right of way, which is still quite close to the, to yeah. the street. We think but, it, but will it be staggered or will it just be all straight? So when you're looking down I don't the street. I think they're, they're not all going to be lined up. Each lot's going to be, I mean, each lot's depth and geometry is a little bit different. So, um, I mean, but they're more or less going to be in line, you know. And Rocky's the one who's going to build them. So he's I mean, I thought that video, <laughs> that video was very impressive to see the video. If, if I could address that. So basically and, what and, we got approved at best. Is Rocky Rizvera. <laughs> I already introduced myself once tonight. Uh, so at Master Plan, we got zero, no setback approved on the yeah. board. What we're asking for in the area where the 30 lots are, we're going we're gonna to use 10 as a, as a guideline there. We're not going to come to zero, but the houses are going to stagger. You know, all the houses are going to have porches, but it's not going to be uniform in a row. But on the other lots, the larger lots, where we might do those condominium units or the apartment units, those might be zero or closer to zero. And those might may be more in a row because okay. it might make more sense. So it gave us approval for zero. We're, we're kind of working with that. Yeah. Okay. And I just thought the video was really, I, I mean, I, I was very impressed with the way the video had the, had the streets laid out and everything. So it, it was kind of neat to be able to see what it, what it really will yeah. look like. Yeah. Um, the other thing, we talked at that meeting, too. That was the one over at Wentworth, I think. Um, in fact, I think I brought it up because of the uh, what, uh, what I think it was Rachel just mentioned the uh, the parking, um, because I was down in Florida and I was in a in a development where they had these sections set aside for maybe four or five parking spots for guests to come. You know, because I don't think you want on street parking in this area here, but I think you you should make some arrangements for those those times when people do have company, you know, where they're going to pick their, their vehicle, something like that. So I don't know what you're going to do. We'll take a closer look at that. Yeah, okay. Um, I have nothing else, really. I think you've done a d good job. Yeah, Sue? I'm sorry, I do have another quick question. Back to my very favorite spreadsheet here. I just want to make sure that I know what it is we can see coming back to us again, because number 55, the last item on this spreadsheet, says that the applicant should consider increasing the width of the proposed parking lane from eight feet to nine feet. That's going to be coming back to us, right? So I believe that's in reference to the on-street parking, if I'm not mistaken, and... That is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, on, on the main road, right? So on, on the Downs Road, yeah. we're on showing some on-street parking. On the Downs Road. And I think we were showing it at eight feet. Okay. I think Bill Bray suggested we go to nine. That. I'm erring on the side of Bill Brace's suggestion. Yep. Just that nine would be better. Uh, <laughs> so I think okay. that's what you'll see us. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've just got one one thing that I noticed, and that is in the package of materials you gave us, um, Goral Palmer on the preliminary traffic assessment, which was done June 11th. You had. Um, the proposed development impact fee of $108,000, and on June 13th, you had a proposed impact fee of, I believe, $82,000. Now, I like the $108,000 better, but if you could <laughs> ex explain uh, the, the change that occurred in those times. Randy Denton with Goral Palmer. Um, the reason for those two, that, that revision and those two things is because we did see a, a typo and a math error. So, un unfortunately, it, it did go down. So, unfortunately can, for you, Can you, can you double them. check that again <laughs> just to make sure? Absolutely. Uh, Bill has. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, if it pleases the board, I can make a motion uh, to approve the bill. Pardon me? Well, you guys are the ones voting. That's right. Uh, motion to approve the preliminary subdivision plan. Second. Second. Any discussion? Those are approved? Well, no. 
Okay. Thank you. Use that as an example. Item number eight, Doug and Susan Williams request a shoreline zoning review for a 108 Winnix Neck Road Assessors Map R83 Lot 9. All right. And staff. So a bit of a unique application for the planning board. I mean, typically don't see uh, dock replacement projects in front of the board, but uh, the, this project is located at 108 Winnix, <coughs> Winnix Neck Road in the R2 uh, and shoreland overlay zones. So, since it's in the shoreland overlay zone, uh, the, in accordance with the town shoreland zoning ordinance, the applicant is in front of the board uh, for review of the replacement of a permanent dock on their property. Uh, section 15C of the shoreland zoning ordinance provides land use standards for the board to review this application. Uh, so, staff has reviewed the application and suggests that the applicant update the board on the status of their main DEP permit by rule application and if they have, and if any other permits are required for the project. Uh, we, have. we do have approval on a staff this year. I'm Susan This is the dock that was, or there was a dock in existence when we bought this house in 1981. We don't know how long a dock has been there, but it's been quite some time. Uh, we replaced it in 1992 uh, with a DEP permit and a building permit from the town of Scarborough. Um, it now was uh, severely damaged when an iceberg landed on it in the January storm. And uh, What's happened over the years, because of the movement on the marsh, is the dock weaves up and down this way and can't side to side. And so we looked at, rather than just repairing it as it currently exists, trying to find a solution that will allow us to keep it level and even all the way across and keep it a uniform 34, 36 inches above the marsh so that it stays above the, high, the highest high tide. Um, so we went looking for a solution that would allow us to do that rather than the kind of dock that has always been there, which is just a wood dock that, as I say, can't and weave side to side. So, go ahead. Uh, this is Doug Williams. Um, we also wanted our design to uh, be less intrusive than the sort of traditional six by six pressure treated type of post. We wanted to improve the sheet flow on the marsh. Um, especially since there's more water on the marsh higher than there used to be. So that's why we're proposing to do dock rather than just repairing what's there. Okay. Um, this, is, this is open for public comment. If there's anybody in the public wishes to speak, seeing none, I'll close it. <laughs> um, Under the board, any comments from anybody on the board? Sue? <clears throat> Notes from staff said that access from the shore shall be developed on soils appropriate for such use and constructed so as to control erosion. Um, I'm assuming that does not affect any erosion putting this in. 
and um, it will really locate it so as to minimize adverse effects on fisheries. There's no active fishery where you are. I mean, there's always fish in the marsh. We there know is, that. It's a very active fishery yeah. uh, where we are. Um, however, the, the most of the fishery occurs out in the river. Right. Um, however, the design of this dock uses two and a half foot, two and a half inch pipes uh, at no higher frequency than the existing posts. In fact, I think we have fewer. Fewer. So there's fewer contact points with the marsh. They're narrower, and it's going to be um, uh, just a bit higher than uh, than what this is now. So that uh, the the water flows in the event that water is all the way up in those those times during the year when it does come all the way up in a tide, and fish are moving along. They're going to move underneath this dock more easily than the one that's there, that's been there forever. I'm going to correct my husband. It's one and a half inch galvanized one pipe, half. not. <laughs> that's your problem. Or even smaller. <laughs> okay. Um, my sister and brother-in-law have one of these on a lake, okay? They don't bring it in in the winter. This is not going to be brought in in the winter either. They have problems with it, with ice. Now, the ice on the lake pretty much freezes solid. This isn't going to happen. Well, excuse me, I live on the marsh. I've been able to cross over the Nonsuch River, frozen solid, more than once in my lifetime. But it doesn't happen every time. Yeah, I'm glad you don't try it too often. <laughs> I don't, I don't we, would, we wouldn't cross it in the winter. Know, those we never have. But that was back in the day, yeah. you know, when winter was winter. <laughs> Um, so, the rising and the falling of the ice in the river is not going to damage this? I mean, I'm just curious. I can't absolutely. imagine how no, is that, it going to be... Is, that's a, a very good question. It's absolutely our intention to not damage it. Um, we have not had uh, ice damage from tidal ice, you know, from ice freezing um, in all the years we've been there. The damage that occurred um, was from a huge flow of ice that drifted out from the upper part of the marsh behind the island. Uh -huh. Okay. Came around, got caught by an east wind, and pushed down. Now with the higher tides that we have now, because the water level is much higher than it used to be uh, more often on the marsh, it actually was able to float until it lodged itself on top of our <laughs> dock. So, and when the tide went out, it was so heavy, it didn't drop. It was sitting on the, on the dock. It's so heavy that when the tide went out, it crushed the dock. So uh, this is designed to be um, a little bit higher yeah. than these because the old dock had, when you look at the picture on the front of our presentation, mm -hmm. the old dock had sunk in because the pilings dropped down over time. The other thing is that when that happened, it was in January 3rd, when it was a, a 13 and 3 quarters inch tide, which is the fourth highest tide in history. Yeah, so it's just normal super high tides around here are 11 and a half or 11 and three quarters, and those are very high tides. So it was really an exceptional one. And had the, had the dock been level at the, at the height it was originally installed at 24 years, uh, 24 years ago, it would never have landed on it. It would have been too high. Mm -hmm. But we, have, we don't have a way of adjusting this dock right now. This one will be adjustable? Yes. Okay. It is set on posts that will stick up above the top of yeah, the dock, I can see those. and you have a, you have a, they have adjustment tools so that we can, as the as the posts change, we can level and and have a part even it so we'll that go down and adjust the dock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for answering my questions. Rachel. Um, actually, I have no questions. Rick. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I don't know if um, adjusting it's going to be easy <laughs> based on the oh, installation no. instructions you provided. It doesn't look like it's going to be. No, you know, but, you might want to have some waiters and. Uh, <laughs> it'll just be nice to be able to do it though, yeah. because right now it's not adjustable, but it, it's not going to be. Easy. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure it, it appears it can be done, but. Uh, well, they they give you a tool that you can hook over the post and level it up and down, so you you loosen the joints. And yeah. yes, you're right; it's not going to be something we're going to want to do a lot. <laughs> but when you get the canting that we get, we can adjust it, which is right now it won't do anything. I would strongly suggest you put it as high as you could possibly. <laughs> but it's the first time. I got no problem, but I think it's fine. I think it looks going to look nice. 
Okay, I'm all set. I'm all set too, and I do have a motion, a draft motion. Um, um, I move to approve the permanent dock replacement project proposed by Doug and Susan Williams on the property at 108 Winnick Neck Road. The property is located within the residential district R2 in the Shoreline Shoreland Overlay District and is identified on the town town of Scarborough tax maps as map R83, lot 9. The planning board has reviewed the application and the supporting documents and finds that the proposed design adequately addresses the shoreland zoning requirements. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All approved? Four, four zero. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Ten twenty eight. Just made I jumped up here quick. Yeah. <laughs> you have thirty seconds. <laughs> okay, wait a second. Chair, I believe in the rest of the uh, members of the planning board in Scarborough. My name is George Kerr. I'm here with my daughter, Alexandra, and Will Conway from Sebago Tech. I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Uh, as you know, my daughters and I started this project with the intent of creating <clears throat> an inviting addition to the town of Scarborough. The revision process has, been many, has had many twists, turns, and hurdles. However, our original vision has never wavered. This is our third board hearing, and I want to thank you all for your time, your consideration, and your guidance as we have developed our final plan. I also wish to thank Jay, Jamel, and Angela. They have been available and responsive, and I appreciate their efforts very much. Also, my neighbors, and I know Chairperson Susan had brought up about neighbors. I did the best that I could to meet with all my neighbors. At this point in time, no one, no, none of my neighbors are opposed to this project. I do have a problem, not like Mr. Rosbarra. I do have a problem with Bill Bray's requirements for me to build a new turn lane on the old Blue Point Road in Route 1. I have that problem for several reasons. I'd like to discuss it with this board. Number one, I think it's outside his purview. I believe that the Maine Department of Transportation evaluated this project in this intersection and did not require a turn lane. In my approval from DOT, Traffic Movement Permit, they do require me to install warning signals if numerous accidents occur after my tenants have occupied the building. I have no problem with this condition on my DOT permit. That requirement cost, should something happen, in excess of $30,000. Mr. Bray does not live in this area but I do. Both of my daughters live in Scarborough. I have had businesses and still have businesses on Route 1 in Scarborough. We know this intersection, and for, and for you who have driven it, you know, as well as I do, that people can make a left turn and also can make a right turn. And I believe there's no need for a new turn lane. As part of our traffic study, we determined that the intersection does not meet the state warrant for a traffic signal. It's quite possible it will meet the warrant, and if a signal is put in, the turn lane would not be needed, and to me, that's money wasted. I know that we've discussed and we've talked about traffic and impact fees. I would like you to know that when we first started this project, 
we expected to have a right in and a right out. I'm not going to get into great detail with that tonight because uh, I had hoped that we would be able to have a right turnout. During our dialogue, we have now put a road onto the old Blue Point Road. My costs have just escalated significantly because of that road. $250,000 to add to the driveway to the old Blue Point Road. I'm paying a $60,000 impact, $60, impact fee for traffic, a $60,000 impact fee for sewer. Adding this turn lane would make the project basically unfeasible, and I, had to have, and I would have to abandon a vision that my daughters and I have guided throughout. What we have here is your traffic engineer, in my opinion, going over and beyond what the DOT, a state agency, has required, and I believe it is in excess and unnecessary. I have a couple other issues that I'd like to discuss with you on the proposed draft that I received tonight. I believe that I've addressed A. Under B, the scale plan for the proposed right turn only entrance designed along Route 1 is stated in the staff comments memo dated 625. The plan should include an alternate treatment in the area not intended for public vehicles such as pavers and grass, grass concrete products. I believe that's unnecessary. We've got plenty of signage and everything else and I would rather just have it paved. I think grass works good in Florida during the winter time, not in Maine. I don't need pavers heaving and snow plows hitting it. So I would hope that we can have an agreement that that is not necessary. On number D, a fully screened dumpster and recycling area as stated in the staff's comment memo 625-18. I think that we discussed that and the reason my daughters and I, and I believe we discussed it at the last planning board meeting, was these are at the very end of the building. We're putting up high fences. As you know, you look around the different properties where they have dumpsters, these gates and the hinges never last. That's why we propose this at the very end of the property. I think it's a prudent way to look at resolving this, the trash issue is because it's all enclosed other than the front. On number two, Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay in lieu fee in the annual, uh, in the amount equal to the estimate construction of a sidewalk. I did agree to that. I like predictability. I believe that that cost should be somewhere in the, in the area of $3,000 to $3,500. I think should the board grant or make a motion tonight to approve this project, I would like to have a dollar amount in that amount I have calculated to be between three and $3,500. Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan. I believe that in your ordinance, the sign permit is a separate permit. So I, I think that we can all agree prior to the issuance of a sign permit, would be fine. Uh, I do have no problem with number four, five, or six. Um, that's standard and I've, I've um, agreed to all that and the impact fees. I think that um, David Hughes, uh, just for your own edification, I worked diligently with him trying to get this project approved. My first quote was somewhere in the area of $34,000. But after uh, I wasn't as lucky as uh, Mr. Risbera, where it went the other way, my fee ended up doubling because of the restaurants. Uh, again, I want to thank you all. Whatever your decision is tonight, uh, my family and I will make the decision whether to move on with this project. When, uh, again, uh, I just want to reiterate this point because I think it's important. We came here with a vision. We tried to carry it out. We've met with your staff. We've had disagreements. We've been able to resolve a lot of the issues. But I truly believe that Bill Bray overstepped his bounds on this issue. 
I comply with the state ordinances, I meet their standard, and for me to spend money off-site I think is wrong, especially when you know that area. When I started this project, I'm going to reiterate this, we believed that we were going to have a right turn and a right, and a, a right in and a right out. Then we found, because I expanded the project land that I personally owned, I gave it to my daughters, we had an exit onto the old Blue Point Road. I'm just saying to you that I have run and owned restaurant Surf Six for 44 years. I've owned and still own quite a few businesses. I own a lot of property on Route 1, a pharmaceutical business, and several homes. We had a vision for this project, and we've carried it out. I think it's something we can all be proud of. I just want to be able to build it. The cost has gone up substantially, and everything has to make sense. There's about $350,000 more that has been driven to this project. If I were to go out and borrow that money, that amounts to about $45,000 a year. You can only charge so much rent in the community to make this a profitable project. I urge you to assist us in finalizing this project, and I just wanted to put my cards on the table with you people as we've had a great relationship. And I would only hope that your approval of this project, you would delete B, C, and D, come up with a fixed cost. I have suggested the area between $3,000 and $3,500. On number three, scratching out building and putting sign permit. And we all know that the fees that I'm going to pay for impact is uh, for the, for, uh, the state, I mean, the traffic is $58,381.74. The sewer fee is $60,985.93. As far as my DEP permit, uh, I believe that the staff received a copy of that. There are no significant problems with that. I think <coughs> it's just time. And I want to thank you all again. I yield my time for any questions, and I urge your support. Okay, before we proceed, um, things got taken out of order a little bit, okay? I apologize. Okay, we, we made note of that. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to add any comments regarding, what was omitted was the staff, staff comments before you started talking, so. so I, ap I apologize for that. Do you want, do you want to uh, comment on any of those? Or? Uh, I think a lot of what Mr. Kerr said is, uh, is more for the board to react to than staff. Um, I will sort of touch on some of his points. Um, you know, staff has met with um, our traffic engineer and uh, based on his review of the project, um, based on the additional traffic uh, provided by this project, that's where the you know, the reasoning for the, the conceptual design for a left-hand turnway on Old Blue Point Road came from. Um, I will note that Old Blue Point Road is a local road, it's not a state road, um, so that's typically a local decision um, and not a state decision. I just wanted to sort of clear that. Um, and, you know, the board typically does ask for fully enclosed recycling and trash areas, whether the applicant agrees or disagrees with that. That's a, typical practice from this board. So staff just wanted to note that and be consistent with other projects. Um, and we did want to note that the outdoor seating will need to comply with the town's good neighbor ordinance. ordinance. Um, we've heard from some neighbors before. Um, and just given that the abutting properties are residential, the board may want to consider limitations to outdoor seating times. That's up to the board. Um, and like the applicant said, the site has not been approved by Maine DEP, but they have provided, the DEP has provided the board and staff a letter um, that sort of states they haven't identified any significant issues on the site after their initial review. So the board typically likes to have those applications in hand prior to a final approval, but you know, with this, with this letter, I think it's a step in the right direction. So I don't know if staff, any other staff has anything else they want to add or? I think it's probably worth just touching on how in the past um, 
the board and, and staff has handled coming up with an estimate for the in lieu fee for sidewalks. Uh, and maybe I'll let Angela sort of take that since that's her area of expertise, but it's a fairly straightforward process. So, Angela, if you. Yeah, um, typically we do it on a, a linear foot basis, and the, the cost is curb Esplanade sidewalk, and so I kind of break that out as a linear foot basis, which is $25 a linear foot is what we have requested by all the other applicants in front of the planning board. So at a 300 foot frontage that you have, that puts you at 7,500. And that's something that is it's standard that we, we haven't really deviated from that for other applicants. Um, it's something usually the staff just um, discusses after approval, which we could, um, mm -hmm. which has never come to the board, I guess. It's just something that has been a standard number. And then I guess I also wanted to just kind of put in a little different light that we did have many conversations about traffic. Obviously, it was the number one topic um, for this project. And I think it was really great that DOT was also at the table um, and talking through the issues we had um, with traffic. But I, I guess I wouldn't pose it as it was Bill Bray dictating what um, what we were requesting. I think um, at those meetings, I, I know I had brought up the point about looking at, say, a, a turn lane at Old Blue Point Road just because of the amount of traffic you're adding to that and trying to get those right-hand turn lanes out of the way so that the Q lane um, doesn't back up and impact their own driveway down Old Blue Point Road. And I guess my other point would be, even if a signal was to go in at a later date, I don't think that's, that turn lane is going to uh, be waste. I mean, at that point, it makes that signal more efficient. You, you're getting those rights out of the way. You're still having that left turn. It just allows that, the light to stop um, to be able to let those lefts out. Um, and the last thing I guess I would bring up is um, the comment about the grass crete and the pavers was another one of my <laughs> comments because I'm always looking for ways to eliminate impervious area just um, with stormwater water quality and treatment. And then also the aesthetics of it. I think that is something that um, it's just a massive amount of payment. Um, and I think it would be actually a better curb appeal to have some grass looking like it looks like grass that you can drive over a fire truck. Really, this is essentially not supposed to be a wide open paved surface. It's meant to be something that if the building is on fire, a fire truck can physically drive over it without um, damaging a fire truck. Um, so I guess those are the, I kind of scribbled down as you were talking, but I, well, I um, will answer any questions you have as we go through. And I, just on the sort of streetscape <clears throat> sort of aesthetic piece, I think one of the things to be mindful of and what Jamel probably would have covered if you know, under normal procedures is that this is in the TBC3 zone and it does talk about maintaining a 15-foot a, uh, streetscape uh, vegetative area along Route 1 um, as part of, so I think that's just part of, part, of the, uh, part of the stew, if you will, for the board to consider as you look at sort of the detailing. But. Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Let me just uh, ask, if I may, uh, ask Angela one question regarding that. <clears throat> That particular um, item you were just discussing, the uh, grass creek type products. Yeah. In the winter time, would that tend to be plowed? Yeah, you'd want to plow it so that emergency vehicles can get over. Okay. It. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know whether you would just because if you plowed it in the winter, wouldn't. You? But it could be the same as you do for um, sidewalks. If they're they're snow blowing sidewalks, they can yeah. snow blow an area that allows that to open up. But what I was wondering is if you plowed it. Yeah. Which can in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wouldn't that, wouldn't some vehicles, you know, drive, uh, cars driving on Route 1 maybe think? Yeah, there is a they, curb. There's a curb there that they right. can go, go So over. that they wouldn't go over it. Yeah, it's a curb, so you'd know it if you went over so, it. So really, <laughs> it, and so what you'll have is coming down Route 1, you'll have a curved area. So coming, you know, in a typical car, you wouldn't want to jump over that curb. Um, but a fire truck would really be the only vehicle that would want to make that left and, and risk jumping that curve okay. because they're in a 
hurry <laughs> to get to the fire. And hopefully they never have to make this movement. In, right. in the best case scenario, we're, we're never having to worry about that turn. But we do need to consider it, of course. So it, it, would, be raised, it would be raised up higher than the regular pavement then? Right, just it's a curb. Like height. maybe an inch or two or something? No, nope, curb height. Inch, like oh, oh, right, it it curb. Yeah, okay. yeah, but it's mountable. Like we have in a lot of areas um, on site plans when they're when the fire trucks, when the fire department is concerned about making certain tight radius, yeah, okay. um, they like to have the mountable curves. So it's it's the same height. It's just at a, it's um, slanted back so they can drive on the tires over. Okay, it. okay. I understand. But that. same height as a curb. Anything else from staff? Not this time. Um, may May I respond sure, to sure. this, yeah. if you don't mind, Mr. Billy? I want you to know when I first came t with this proposal, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse lane because I did tell uh, your staff who, again, we can disagree, but there's mutual respect. I got to be clear on that. And the same thing with uh, Bill Bray. He knows how I feel about him. I expressed my concerns to him in front of everybody. Um, this project, and I, I've got to tell you this, came here when we first started with a vision three years ago. We expected at the very least to have a right in and right out. I've been told not to bring that up tonight by people that I've hired. Prior to that road going out to the old Blue Point Road, this board would have had to make a decision if I didn't throw that land in and probably I made a mistake by being honest and said that my intent was to build any other building 10,000 square feet on that property. That cost by that road has created almost a $300,000 increase in my cost to do this project just from site plan. Now that the road's there and we're looking at a right turn in only, I ask you this question. And I've sat in on all these meetings dealing with traffic. And Angela just brought up a good point, because Bill Bray brought up the same point and kind of shocked myself my, and my daughters. If Old Blue Point Road is to back up, where do, what are people doing? Where do they go? If you had two cups of water here, and you put two holes in this one and one hole in this, which would drain faster? This one. I believe that a right in and a right out was the best approach. Someday I'll probably come back and fight that battle with you. But I do not think me having to get approval on a project, having A, B, and C in it, I'm not happy with. It, the costs just keep going on. As far as a compromise, that $7,500 that you've calculated, I can live with that. Again, another item that is doubled. But for me to do off-site work, knowing that the main Department of Transportation did the study and didn't make that requirement, I don't think that I should have to do that. And I think this is outside uh, Bill Bill's purview. And it all has to make dollars and cents. I've got tenants. And when they drive into the project, they people, as you know, <coughs> expect to drive out the same way. I own parking lots. I own restaurants. I've worked. It's not just an investment for me. We've designed this on experience. And I think it's a beautiful building. And it's going to change the look of that area. And all I'm asking this board is to have trust in me like you did when I built Sea Ridge. You've never had a complaint. Everything was done by the book. And I will do that with this project. We are committed to change the face of that area with your help. Because I disagree with your staff, it's nothing personal. They've done a great job. We've been working on this project for three years. I just ask you to agree with me. We put a lot of time and energy in this. 
and we've already got overruns, I don't need any more. And your own fire and police department wanted to have an entrance in, just so you'll know that. But I can live with, we, with, with what we have now under my terms and conditions, and I urge you to support us. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I might, and as you know, George, this is I'm sure going to come to no surprise because we've had had many conversations. And so, um, again, I think as sort of Angela was saying, one of the things I want to be sure that um, uh, is being framed, and I know the board members know this, and Mr. Kerr knows this, but for the public who may not be aware, that really the discussion around improvements, all the access improvements, frankly, all these improvements are, are grounded in the site plan review ordinance and the provisions around site access and improvements at unsignalized intersections that don't meet a, a certain level of service, that's, that's where the physician that our peer review traffic engineer, Bill Bray, and staff's comments are generated from. It's not sort of a, a, a wish of, of staff, if you will. It's how, how do we meet the standard? And, and if, if um, and, and in that regard, it's really about um, reading from the language, at an unsignalized intersection, if the level of service is forecasted to be less than a, a D post-development, then the installation of traffic signal and or additional turning lanes shall be investigated. Um, if these improvements are found not to be warranted, then the level of service less than D may be acceptable. And I think that's where Mr. Kerr's position is, is they're ask he's asking the board to find um, that such an improvement isn't warranted. What I'm so, asking so the, the, ordin the ordinance does sort of lay yeah. it out there for the board to make that determination. With all due respect, I'm just asking the board to go along with the main Department of Transportation's evaluation of this intersection. They did not make this requirement. In my approval, as I stated, what they requested is for me to install warning signals if there were accidents. That cost will exceed $30,000. I don't believe in what Bill Bray has recommended to the staff. And again, it's nothing personal with him. I just want to follow what Main Department of Transportation put before and what I'm signing off to with them. And you do have a copy of their requirement for me. Off-site mitigation. Route 1, Old Blue Point Road. May I read this? The application will be responsible for, for installing intersection collision avoidance and warning systems, ICAWS. If three or more reportable crashes involve outbound or inbound Old Blue Point traffic occur within a six-month period after occupancy, and work with the Town of Scarborough on maintenance responsibilities. Submit designs, plans, and coordinate the work as specified in Part D of overall requirements. Just that language, again, and I keep throwing cost to you because it comes to a point where this is not cost prohibitive. This is going to become cost prohibitive. This is $30,000 minimum. I mean, it's so easy for somebody to say, go do this, go do that. But at some point, the project has to make economic sense. And a lot of times, people don't understand that. That's why I designed those restaurants, because I've been in the restaurant business for 44 years. Those places are going to be clean. Without, with you people, just on another issue, when I asked... And we talked about planners. Instead of meeting the requirement of your ordinance, you said, yes, that's a good idea. Because it's clean. This is a chic building. And it's going to be changed. When this building is built, with your help and your assistance, it's going to change that area. But it's got to be cost. It cannot be cost prohibitive. And you keep driving the cost up. I think I've done the best that I can. I think it really lies with the board. And again, I thank you for all your time. Your staff <coughs> has met with us time and time again. Bill Bray attended the meetings, Main Department of Transportation. Everybody has been helpful. 
Now the decision is yours. My cards, my family, my two daughters, our cards are on the table. But the project with a little extension here or this road and every all these requirements and requests, it's practically cost prohibitive to be even build the project. Also on the front of the building, uh, we were looking at cultural stone rather than stone, uh, just to look at some of the costs, but on the pillars we were, we were going to stick with the uh, stone, and I know that I just wanted to throw out that because uh, we were looking to do the whole thing in stone, but it's uh, you're looking at another twenty five thirty thousand dollars So what we looked at is some cultural stone and I do have pictures and I can share that with uh, the staff um, We've been meeting with the architects and just trying to fine-tune everything but again, I think I've said my piece and uh, It's up to the board to make the final decision. And I thank you. Mr. Chairman for the extra time. Okay, uh, staff has nothing else to add at this point? I do not. Okay. Who would like to uh, go first? <laughs> okay. I am not an elected official. <clears throat> I'm an appointed official. My appointed appointment is clearly to do one thing and that is to make sure that the zoning ordinances as passed by the town council are adhered to. I don't have to like them. Frequently, I don't like them. Tonight, there were a couple I didn't like <laughs> at all, but that's nothing I have any control over. And I think that staff has explained why what was said was what, what why what was said was said by our peer reviewers. So I don't see that I have any choice but to go along with what it is the staff is saying. So that's all I have to say. Okay, uh, Rachel? Yeah, I've got um, a couple of things here. I, I echo uh, Ms. Auglis's uh, statement about we are bound by the ordinances. Whether I am we, following whether, the ordinance. And, well, whether we like them or not, uh, or the, the decisions that, that fall from them, I guess. Um, I'm looking at number three on the proposed draft motion, and I just want to check something with you, sir. Uh, it says, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall, shall submit a final signage plan to the planning department. Yeah, I think I think what the what it what was it just an oversight and I Jam, Jamel can correct me. I think instead of building, I think the word sign because it's two different permits. Now, Jamel, are we looking for the final signage plan or an additional permit? Um, so there is a required sign permit. Here. Right. Um, so that is something separate and distinct from the building permit. So the question is to the board, there's a there's a general um, schematic in tab four of what the sign might look like, um, and so typically the the board reviews a sign. Um, but if you're comfortable with the direction it's headed, oftentimes the board has made a condition of approval that the staff, so long as we have a general <laughs> sense of what the sign's going to look like, and and I agree to that. That that's not an issue. Yeah, I think uh, that we, I was getting a little confused there. We were really just looking for the, um, the, the plan, and the, in the past, the board uh, has uh, been comfortable uh, and turned that back to the planning department just to take a look at yes, your final plan. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and I will say that we have in the past required and con very consistently required the... Uh, developers to fully screen the dumpsters. And, and I understand that um, the, uh, the hinges might not last forever and might be a problem, but it is something that we have, we have asked in, this in the is, past. This is much larger than any other dumpsters. We've got four minutes, about 40 feet. So, but I just want to express my concerns. That's why we located them in the very back. Mm -hmm. I understand, um, again, 
Yes, ma'am. We, we, have, we have been consistent with that. Um, I, I don't know what to say about the Route 1, uh, about the uh, <clears throat> Blue Point, Old Blue Point Road problem. Um, you referenced a D status. Yeah, I was just reading the provision in the ordinance um, that sort of talked about when an, <clears throat> an unsignalized intersection doesn't meet a certain level of standard that the board and, has. And where would we find it's that, now where would we find whether that, it, what the standard is? In other words. It, it references a D standard in the ordinance, is that what you mean, or, mm -hmm. or what? So, so how does it get to a D standard? Uh, it's based on, and this is where the traffic engineers, and I'm sure it's spelled out um, in, that, um, in the traffic engineer's report, um, but it has to do with, I believe it's uh, the amount of time it takes a vehicle to get through or queuing. There's a bunch of criteria. <laughs> Um, it might be delays and crashes. Right, delay. No. So, yeah, there's a number of criteria that go into it, and it. So it's not one thing or another. It's just a. It's a weighting, I suppose, of a, a host of characteristics. Yeah, I, I just don't recall seeing that reference at all in uh, Mr. Bray's report, review comments. I they, I didn't see that listed as a standard that was met or not met, as the case may be. Well, I guess that's, I, I would ask the applicant what their traffic engineer found for that intersection Good. for a level of service. Uh, well, Conway Sebago Technics, I'm embarrassed to, to be honest that I don't know. We may not be D, we might be C. Um, I can't speak to that. Um, I don't know if the staff has a copy of the traffic submittal mm -hmm. that we could reference. I, I would submit that there's a, there's a, it sounds like a $300,000 difference between a C and a D standard. Well, I think, just to be clear, I believe the sort of $300,000 number is referencing his driveway getting out to Old Blue Point, right. not the actual improvement Correct. on Old Blue Point. Uh, uh, so the, the Blue that, Point, the, yeah. the improvement you estimated at what? No, when I, I don't think when, there has been no, an no, no, no. for that. Yet. Rachel, that, I, I don't correct. Let me, let me explain okay. this. When the first time I came to the project in, with you, we had a right in and a right out. We didn't have the plan on the old blue point, okay? What I did is I gave my children the other land that I owned. That triggered that we had access to old blue point road. Now we had to put a road in. All the drainage and everything had to be modified and changed, including my application for DEP. That's what increased the pro site project up $300,000 from my previous bid. We're, we, in, we are in excess of over $600,000 just for site work, the way that my plan is without the extras that are being added here. So we don't have a cost for, the, uh, for adding the left turn lane on Old Blue Point. I just don't believe Mm -hmm. that if the main department of transportation didn't require me to do this my meeting with bill bray this was never an issue because if you drive that road you see that people get in the right lane they turn right and people stop and they turn left they do it now they do it now <clears throat> And I understand that. And, and I own the property. Faced. And I own the property on the corner of Blue Point Road, where Ashley Loren is, in the next four buildings down. I travel that every day. I've had property there for 20 years. Dermalogic Partners. That's my pharmaceutical company. I bought the old school from the town. It's just that I believe that this project complies with your ordinance. Everything that we've, we've said we're gonna do, we've exceeded. At some point, I have to say, enough is enough. And it's nothing personal with Mr. Bill Bray, but if you have the Department of Transportation doing a study, you're sitting down making recommendations, I don't need all these add-ons. As I've said, 
Just that extra $300,000 amounts to about $45,000 a year in interest in principal. That money you can't get from tenants. I'm not only a developer, I own businesses. I try to make things work. I've got pretty solid tenants. It's hard to convince them that they can't make a right out. They gotta go the old blue point road. We are all creatures of habit. I've seen other projects before us tonight that, have, that are making turns on uh, Route 1. I'm not asking for that tonight. I'm putting up signs so people don't enter or don't leave that way. We're not going to stop them no matter how much of a grassy knoll or whatever we put there. I just want to be able to keep the property clean. I want it to be plowed. The fire department, the police department said, hey, look, there's nothing wrong with the right out. We want to be able to get in. But I'm willing to fight that the next day should I build another building there. But this project and this site plan, as I told you earlier, is predicated basically on putting another 10,000 square foot building up. My intention was to change the, the look of this place. But I can't let the cost keep driving up everything double and double and double. I gotta say no. And I don't want you to think I'm fighting back. I have the ultimate respect for your staff and everyone that's been involved in this project to David Hughes. I didn't like it coming from 32,000 to 60,000, believe me. I didn't swallow that easy. 3,500 to 7,000, I'll eat that. Because that's a standard they use for everybody. I didn't know that. I calculated a little bit different, but that's their choice, I'll follow that. I just like predictability, that's why I threw a number in there. Right, and, and I'm trying to work my way through a way yes, to help you get this done. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate uh, that. And I don't, I don't think I've done that, so I think I'm done. Um, you did ask the question about what is the level of service at that turn, and I have mm -hmm. been able to find it in the, in the applicant's traffic movement permit that they submitted and the materials they put together. Um, so at... In 2019 p.m., this is at a no-build scenario, so without this application moving forward, Old Blue Point uh, left turn is at an F currently. Old Blue Point right turn is at an A. Um, 2019 build scenario, um, Old Blue Point left turn is at an F. Um, there's a, I, and I don't quite understand what this, it's second slash vehicle so it's a timing thing, I think. So under the no build scenario, um, the left turn is at uh, 166 seconds. That's an F. Under uh, under the build scenario, it's 563 seconds, which is remains an F. Um, and again, so the right turn lane is eight seconds at an A. Right turn is uh, goes to 361 seconds to an F. So essentially, the the road already needs. The left turn. I'll let, please, <laughs> um, well, what he's saying, so in the no build, um, the left turn, yes, is already failing. It's an F. It's already failing. It will continue to be an F. The right turn, however, c c currently is an A. It will become an F. And that's where the, the right turn lane and looking at is that plausible is why staff is suggesting we look, look at a concept. But everything addresses a left turn. Yeah. No, what I'm saying is the level of service goes from A to an F after development. That's the build, no build. Right on the right turn, I know, but everything in, in the discussion addresses yeah. a but left turn, not, addresses not a right way. turn. Staff's yeah. suggestion is if you build a left turn lane, that will alleviate right turn. So It's an extra lane. It's an extra <laughs> lane, so <laughs> those who want to take a right turn aren't getting queued behind those who are looking to take the left turn. Um, and that's what we don't have here, and I think it's part of what sort of the scenario is. What does adding that lane do? That's the missing piece mm -hmm. of information. And I do just want a, another sort of point of clarity. Um, I think one of the comments has been around, at this point, we're in, in a, asking the applicant to really look at the feasibility of building a left turn lane within the existing right-of-way, because I do think that there is, you know, as, as sort of the 
the ordinance states that it, it says where warranted or so again that's where the plan board needs to as Mr. Kurz already indicated his position on it so it's, it really does boil down to for the board to work this one out so what we're missing mm -hmm. is we're missing the knowledge of what how much of an improvement in the left turn lane coming out of Blue Point Road would be and that's where Roger, our intent was when we met with the Department of Transportation, I think the staff and myself were hoping that they would be putting a light there. I was going to pay a third. The town was going to pay a third. And DOT was going to pay a third. They said they didn't have any money. So I said, well, I'll pay your share, but just make sure I get paid back. You mean the state? The state. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and, I, and is that somewhat accurate, Jamal? So from what I remember, but I yeah. think the, your traffic report didn't. Well, our there. traffic report, because basically I did it for the town too. Didn't warrant a light. How it doesn't, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got to be frank with you. Yeah. That would have been the easy out for all of us. I mean, I've done the best I can. Yeah, sure. um, and I'm going to just keep my mouth shut and sit down. Rachel, do you have anything else? No. Okay. Rick, before, before you ask some questions, can I just ask one question? Um, so, forgetting about the two, the right and the left turn lane out of uh, Blue Point Road, you're in agreement with doing the uh, road coming off of the site onto Blue Point Road? Yes, I'm committed okay. to doing that. So, we're basically, we're down to <coughs> adding that extra lane on Blue Point Road. That's it's already doing. there. No, no, the extra lane. The extra the extra turn lane. Extra turn lane on, blue on the point. Blue Point Road to uh, that's approach what this to is, Route One. That's what this it's is already coming there. Down. So People, you're saying it's wide enough that there's two lanes. People do it now. So then it's striping. That's for the town to do. That's not for George Kerr. So what are we talking about? And and that was my question because if the road's already failing, whose responsibility is it to handle a failing road? Ab absent, that's a assuming that nothing ever went in. Right, and that's, at where that the that's where the ordinance says where it's at a level of service. Yeah, I can, I'll read it again. When I bought the school from the town of Scarborough, they said they were going to put a lane in there back then. That was almost 18 years ago. You mean a middle turn lane on Route 1? Is that what you're talking the about? The lane that we're talking about right oh, now, oh, 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 oh. Jim Wendell yeah. took five feet of the property that I bought from the town and said they were going to put a lane in. It's been 15, 18 years, nothing's, nothing's happened. I don't want to be responsible for a town road. I got enough cost on my own project. And if it's only paint, you're, I'm giving you $60,000, put the, put the money in paint. It's an impact fee. Yeah, I don't have too much to add um, to the discussion. Uh, I understand the applicant's feelings, and um, I'd like to uh, help you, but with without that left-hand lane there, and, and I. I know some people, you're saying it's, if it's wide enough now that people are making a left and a right. Um, my concern would be if someone was making a left and essentially blocking people from making a right. Um, it, it's already a bad road. Um, And then C and D um, normally, you know, if you follow the rules, I'm, I'm, I'm the board member that says if you follow the rules, you get to build what you want. But um, the staff is, uh, I think staff's right. So I, I don't, I can't help you. I don't, 
I don't have a lot to add other than what's already been said. I All set? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't. There's no sorry. I, I'm, I'm a big boy. I can take it. Well, I, you know, this is really a tough one. I, I don't, I don't really know what to, what to say either. Um, I can, I can appreciate what you're saying. You know, if, if the road is already failing, it, it's probably the town's responsibility. But the way the ordinance reads, you know, we're required to, are uh, basically required to go by the ordinance. Okay. So we're, we're caught between a rock can and I, a Can yeah. I pose a question? Maybe we can help. you can help me. If, we, if I don't build the road and I take that piece of land out and put it back in my name, what are we going to do when I come back with an application? Now my only ad, entrance and exit is Route 1. Mm -hmm. I posed this to Jay before. Uh, address the left turn. Are so you gonna, so are you, one of the issues... So this project, I mean, that was one let's, of the... Let's just take that right, yep, old blue point out of the picture. So the, the project, as, as proposed, um, would, warrant a left, would warrant a left turn uh, lane treatment along the Route 1 right away. And as my understanding is, to be able to get that, if, if folks, and I think we might have talked about this at Sketch Plan, and maybe it was even at the May meeting, um, you know, this, this stretch of road is just two lanes uh, of highway. It doesn't have the sort of center lane, uh, center turn lane. Um, so to my understanding, based on the early discussions with the traffic engineers in the room, was to make a left turn lane uh, uh, treatment, there would have to be additional right-of-way um, purchased by Mr. Kerr, and, and there would be improvements along the Route 1 corridor, that would be pretty significant as well. So that, that's what we'd be looking and, at. And um, did I not bring a whole plan in, which I had contracted, to solve the problem for a long period of time? I brought that in when we met with DOT, and Bill Bray was not there at that first meeting? And you said, no, just worry about your project? Well, it was a pretty significant change. You're going well, from two lanes to one lane on Route one. And I mean, that would you need DOT. Angela, That's not a Angela, local and I answer. understand that because this project was is a conflict with your ordinance. I don't no, want to I no, never no. wanted I never <laughs> wanted the left hand turn lane. I said to you, let me go right in and right out like Pronto. Did I not say that? Uh, yes, you wanted right in right okay. out. Correct. Right in and right out. Yep. We said no left. Then the road came up. Um, I believe actually the center median came up. So I, I, the block yeah. left I, I don't want to debate yeah, the I, issue. This, this, uh, I just think, if you don't mind, I feel like the, the, the board's job is to, yep. is to deal with the application before you. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of ways you could skin yep. the cat. And actually, the, and as we've talked about, I think, before, um, the town is recently, we actually just are in the process of securing a, uh, uh, we have a grant through the regional uh, transportation folks to help us study the Route 1 corridor, to understand access management, and this is one of the sections that we know we need to look at. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, again, I feel like there's, we could sort of take this in a number of different pathways, but I, th I think in the interest of the hour and the board's yep. charge, it's really to sort of understand the, the application before you and, and deal with, with, with what's proposed. And um, there's sort of time to talk about greater, broader improvements it, along the Route it, 1 corridor. It may be an application before it's time. That's what may be discussed here tonight. I'm just making the recommendations. I would like to get approval, if possible, if you find it, uh, without A, B, C, and D, and I can live with the rest of it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Pleasure of the board. I don't know what the motion would be. Uh, you have a motion. Yeah, okay. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you're about to entertain a motion, one thing I would like to ask, and it doesn't have to do with traffic, I promise. I did hear the applicant mention that they're, they're, he's proposing to make some modifications to the detailing of the building. Um, it'd be good just to understand. You, you mentioned you were going to change the stonework, um, and I think that's a, typically a, a detail the board dives into when we don't get distracted by <laughs> other items as well. Um, so I, I think it's just worth 
Yeah, I, having a grander understanding of what that means. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, do do the driving cost. We were going to. We had talked about putting stone up against the front of the building. Instead, we'll probably use cultured stone, which is very similar. And in the post, we were going to use actual stone. And I do have some sheets I can give to the staff. <coughs> I think it'd be good for the board to take a look, be sure they're comfortable with that approach, yeah. and if so, we could modify the conditions to good. include Thank that. You. that. So, okay. Angela? Um, I just noted that one of the things you were talking about that you, um, I guess we didn't discuss that you weren't in favor of was one of them about um, looking at a 10 scale kind of drawing of that entrance on Route 1, and that was more isn't that what you That's said? B, I believe, or C. 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 Um, that was more about um, doing spot grading so that we know that it drains correctly and <coughs> make sure that gutter line of Route 1 is, is draining properly. So I just wanted to make sure if we wasn't discussed, and if you're asking to take that off the table, I think it would be worth a discussion. And if I, if I understand, your, your concern with C is probably less around the spot grading and more around the treatment, the concrete or the, or the grass papers. That, that's really more your concern. Yes, so again, sir. I guess we'd look at the will of the board. Um, the board is inclined. Um, so we look to the will of the board to help, and, and staff can certainly help revise comments as needed. Okay, should I uh, read the motion? Well, don't look at us. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, here's the draft motion. Um, I move to approve the project in, uh, titled Old Blue Point Crossing proposed by Ashley uh, Alexandra Holding, LLC, as depicted on the plan, as set, the plan set for, prepared by Sebago Technics, dated 6 8 18, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Um, I'll skip the findings and just go down to the conditions. And uh, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include, um, just uh, what was D? Just what was skipping A, B, and C? I don't know if the board agreed to that or not. Okay, uh, I'll read them all and, and the board can decide what they want well, to do. Well, Roger, I might, no. rather than make a motion, maybe it's worth the board talking about yeah. what your, yeah. the will is. You, you well, really haven't. I, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's what I Excuse to what do. I, may, may I? Have, sure. I mean, because this is ridiculous. Excuse me. It's 1130 at night, and we've gone around and around and around the same topic. Nothing has changed. We all have the same opinions. I think we ought to table this, if that's the right word. I don't know what to do. I don't think we're ready to make a vote on this. I don't want to vote on something that's going to get him all upset. But on okay. the other hand, on the other hand, I don't want to sit here anymore either. So if the discussion needs to go on further, I think it needs to go on with staff. Because we're, go ahead. No, I, if, if I may, I think there's really two or three decision points to be made. And, and what I might do is put those forward and, and sort of take a straw poll of the board and then staff can refine these conditions and see where it lands. Um, the ap applicant has asked to strike A. Not A. Oh, not okay. No, I, I apologize. I All right, I, I, apologize. I wasn't sure why. You, that, I, I apologize. Okay, we'll move on. We'll move quickly. Uh, so, so the other big one, obviously, is around the take a look at the left turn lane on the old blue point approach to Route One. So we need the board to generally weigh in on: is that something you're willing to strike, or is that a condition that should remain? I think I've heard two people say pretty clearly I feel it should remain, but I, I'm not sure if I've heard the, the, the general will of the board. Well, the, this, this a B is actually two separate things. Okay. Well, that's okay. Do you want to strike can, B or not strike We can split them up if you'd like. Don't strike. How many want to, may, how many please, want to strike please help. B? Yeah. What do we break? Raise your hand if, if you would you like to strike I B. I can't, I'm not at this point in time, I'm not prepared to strike B, C, or D. I don't think it's our. I don't. Well, that makes 
that easier? Because that was going to say the next the next question has to do with C, and it really has to do principally around the grass pavers. Yeah. Uh, the applicant right now has proposed to have that area paved as shown, and mm -hmm. so. Um, now we've clearly heard from one member that they think it should be grass pavers or some other type of treatment. Um, other board members? I don't think this is kosher. This, this, um, this situation. I, I, guess, I can strike. I guess I'm sorry to put the board in this decision. I Thank guess you. it's been kind of late and um, Here's the thing. I think I'm just going to. What is wrong with my idea of tabling this with the, with the idea that there's unresolved problems? And I think that the unresolved problems are not something that we sitting here as a board tonight are going to be able to resolve. I, I think the problem, Susan, if I may, is we've had these discussions with the applicant where this, okay. is, the, this is the board's decision point. There, there isn't, uh, George, tell me if I'm, I'm wrong I agree here, with you. We've, we've discussed these items a few times, so okay, now gonna, it is the board's job to make the decision. I'm going to go with my friend to my right over here and, and no, who said don't strike? You said don't strike. I, I, I think it should remain exactly as it is. Okay. This is, I hate to see this project not go forward. I really I hate, understand, it's, but, it's, but well, we can't change we can't what we can't change. Strike those. Those are the same rules we hold everybody else to. That's right. So I'd be doing, I'd be contradicting everything I've said for the last two years here if I let, everybody's got to follow the same rules. And if you follow the same rules, then you get to build what you want. Um, you know, the, the turn lane, okay, it, you can look at it again, and, and it again. but that's a bad intersection um, for left turns. Let's not go through it so, again, please. Um, I the, motion. I, the reason I was wondering whether we should table it, like Sue suggested, mm -hmm. is because we, we don't know, at least I haven't heard, by putting in those uh, right and left turn lanes out of Blue Point, mm -hmm. how much of an improvement that would make <coughs> on that? Certainly, if the board wants more information, that's. And no. I think it is in the traffic <laughs> movement permit, though, and maybe Sebago could speak to it. I mean, you have the traffic engineer has looked at some of that, or no? What's that answer? Um, if what happens with the when a new right turn lane is built or left turn, however you want to call it, on Old Blue Point Road? We haven't really made up the geometry. Well, yes. you we come have up not. To and so the level of service that's associated with that. Then. I'm going to get up and walk out. Because we're asking the applicant to actually spend a lot more money. Or something that there may not be a significant improvement. That's what I'm getting at. I think that's Angela, I, I, for the record, when I received this information, <clears throat> I had planned on expending X, X amount of dollars. I put a stop to all that because it's like a printing press. It, it's just, to me, becomes a waste of money. I think that I've done everything to satisfy the board, satisfy the town, and it's the best that I can do. I mean, my daughters and I, we've tried to bring a nice project forward and meet all the criteria of zoning ordinance. And uh, we've got a few little items that, that we don't agree on. And then we're going to leave them up to the board to make that decision. And let the ax fall where it may. I mean, that's the best we can do. I can't keep spending money on a project when there's no light and no value to complete it because I can't get the rents and my tenants are upset because they have one entrance and exit, and you know, I'm trying to sell this thing at the same time. I've got four tenants that are ready to sign a lease. So time is also of the essence, and you guys have been great. I harbor no ill feelings. I couldn't ask for better people to work with. And I mean that, and including the board to be here at 11.30 tonight or whatever time it is. I thank you. I just wish you could just make a decision so I can get on and uh, move on. In the same way with the staff. I can't knock anybody. I don't, I 
don't know what to say. Why can't I would say if, uh, if there's any member of the board who's willing to make a motion, then that would be... I would like to make a motion. We'll see where it falls. I, I would like to... Uh, the draft motion for the Old Blue Point Crossing site plan, I move to approve the project with the following findings, conditions, findings and conditions. And I don't think I need to read them all because they're written down. Okay? Is there anything else I need to say? The only thing that staff might offer is that we make an adjustment to number three to say prior to the issuance of a signed permit rather than building permit. Okay. And then the other item I might add is that we consider adding a number eight that um, the applicant provides, uh, and I know we have that materials here, revised architectural detailing related to the stone uh, detail of the building. Would, did somebody write that down? Because I didn't. Okay, right I would like and to. Do we want to add the seventy-five hundred dollars for the sidewalk? And we could also make an adjustment to number two to read prior to issuing the building permit, the applicant shall pay, strike, and in lieu fee, uh, shall pay seventy-five hundred dollar fee. So that we're still clear that it's for. You could just say comma and amount <coughs> equal to the estimated construction. Okay. So now somebody pretend you're me. <laughs> Second. And read that. It being 11:30, staff will read the conditions Please. for the board's consideration. Please. Uh, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan sh set <laughs> shall be revised <laughs> to include. The minimum lot width and maximum individual building footprint zoning standards. B, a conceptual design for a 150-foot left turn lane on Old Blue Point Crossing Road. I believe that should just say Old Blue Point Road mm -hmm. at the intersection of Route 1. If the plan department deems this improvement to be feasible within the right-of-way, then the applicant shall be responsible for constructing the off-site improvements. A 10 scale plan of the proposed right turn in only entrance design along Route 1, as stated in the staff comment memo dated 625.18. This plan should include an alternate, alternative treatment in the area not intended for public vehicles such as pavers or grass creep products. A fully screened <coughs> dumpster and recycling area, as stated in staff comments memo dated 625.18. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay $7,500, comma, a fee in the amount equal to the estimate, estimated construction of the sidewalk along the property's Route 1 frontage. The funds are to be directed to the town's multimodal reserve account. Three, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan to the plan department. The design is to be generally in keeping with the conceptual description in tab four of the applicant's June 8th, 2018 submission. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall adjust and finalize the traffic impact fees identified on the traffic peer review memo by Traffic Solutions dated 6 18, 18 and provide final payment. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Five, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall coordinate with the fire department to discuss the required fire suppression infrastructure within the proposed building and the proposed location for restaurant hoods. Six, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit approval by the Sanitar Scarborough Sanitary District. B, approval by the main DEP. Seven, Prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor and is to be coordinated through the plan department. And eight, uh, the applicant shall, prior to the issuance of building permit, the applicant shall provide revised architectural details related to the stone detail of the building. That's you made the motion. I'll second. Speaking. You That's you second. speaking. Second. No, I'm just trying to keep things straight. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Ken. Do well, I ask? Now we vote. vote. Uh, okay. Any to, no further discussion, right? Uh, yes. So we would be voting on it as right. read. But yep. For as read. Okay. I'll look for the discussion I have. Mr. Chair. Yes. All those in favor? 
None opposed. Thank you. Yeah, next meeting. Okay, staff report. Um, uh, yeah, nothing to report tonight. Wait, I'll send an email. Uh, administrative amendment report. None to report tonight. Any correspondence? I believe you received a few letters from Ver about the Verizon. I believe those were provided to you this evening. Is that correct, Karen? Yes. Yes, they were. Okay. Oh, yep. sorry. And they had, um, number eight had a letter of support, number 10 had a letter of support, and number nine had their DEP letter. So just okay. to note that those weren't brought up. Okay. Um, an adjournment? I make a motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? You want to give us an update on the Transportation Committee, Roger? No. No, you sure? <laughs> <laughs>